Hello everyone, welcome to episode 131 of the Warhammer 40,000 podcast that is known throughout the lands as Look Out Sir. My name's Dan and it's that bit at the beginning where I take it upon myself to introduce my special pal, my cuddly buddy, my good friend, Philip. How you doing Phil? Do you enjoy the fact that we're having to re-record this intro because I forgot to hit record the first time? Uh, no, if I'm honest. Um, I've lost the will to live. But other than that, I'm good, thank you very much. There you go. What is always a shame, there's only ever been a few instances where I have accidentally not hit record when we started thinking we were recording. Uh, there definitely needs to be some kind of audio cue to this software, don't you think? Like something that makes it go like three two one you're on you know like yeah something just make, make it really obvious yeah yeah because yeah because if not and maybe this is us just being a little bit too full of ourselves but it feels like our best work is always lost you know because i feel like that was probably one of the hottest intros we've ever done or well, at least in a while yeah for sure it was it was good energy full of but... laughs it was i mean it was very off topic it was a rambling star which is exactly. by all means your favorite uh intros I enjoyed it. We talked about, you know, Mr. Tickle. Uh, yeah, you got you got some childhood references in there. There was a whole thing, and it was really good. Um, the problem is, though, I, I I don't think it's going to do our listeners or ourselves any, uh, you know, any justice by trying well, to recreate it no, by reintroducing we, we, the topics. No, we won't do that. Let's move on and talk about... Plus, there were secrets doing. revealed about Phil that he really doesn't want out there. Uh, the do you know what? That's, that's probably for the best, actually. Yeah. Exactly. You're thinking that now, Phil. You're thinking, my God, I've saved myself from that, that exactly. potential fate. Anyway, there you go. You, the listener, can just wonder about what that could have been. Um, but Phil really did, uh, you know, lay himself bare uh, in the original version. <laughs> Open my now. soul up. Yeah. As he did. He really did. He was talking about his pearls and everything. It was, it was <laughs> crazy. Um... <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about today, Phil? <laughs> right, so we have the last of the uh, Warzone N- N- Nihilus books. Was it? Is Warzone... it the last? Are they never doing well, another one? No, no, it's a, no of the Warzone Nackmund. Gotcha. Uh, currently, because obviously it's a two-part uh, book. Um, we assume. The, yes. Uh, well, I mean, there's no numbering on this one, so who's to know? Uh, exactly, book, it could be any book, old thing. Um, it, it's, it's normally it's, it's always so far been done in twos. So we assume this one is this one is Rift War. Um, so we're going to be talking about the three different special uh, rules, not talking about Crusade stuff. So we've got the Codex Supplement for Castellans of the Rift, which is a Primaris Space Marine specific uh, set of rules. Uh, we've also got two armies of renowned. We've got the Warp Meld Pact, which is all about the Thousand Suns doing mutagenic transformations. Uh, and then the last one is uh, Courtiers of the Homunculi, which is all about those evil Drakari. Monstrosities that they are. Um, so there we are. We have gone over that. And then we do an intro, or rather, this is the intro. Cool, blimey. Uh, we do an outro uh, where we just catch up about general things, uh, plug RFW, uh, and talk about my experiences yeah. at the, uh, the the War World event I did the other week. So that was fun. Um, but before we do any of that, we have, of course, a five star review. Come on now, Timmy. You've got your orders. You've got to do it. Uh, uh, but, I d- but I don't want to, sir. You've got your orders. Now get up there, get over that trench, and get me that five-star review, and get it back here right away. Uh, okay, sir. All right, Phil, as is the established format of this bit, what do you say in response to this piece? Well, I'm hoping we're going to do some audible reviews. <laughs> It would have been sensible to have moved over to Audible because you made me aware uh, during the week or last week, potentially, uh, that we have a few uh, from Audible America, uh, which we weren't able to identify because there isn't any kind of central hub by which we can view Audible reviews. Have we actually checked as well, though, Phil, just for the sake of clarity, if any other variables of Audible would within itself contain reviews? I can't remember. We're now going to have to check every country. Uh, I can't remember if the dot com ones were specifically America or if they also included UK ones. Um, I think they were quite specifically American. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, I'll have to double check next time. 
because it was. I mean, yeah, we're doing quite well in Armenia checked. at the moment, and uh, we're, we're we're one of the highest ranked uh, podcasts in Armenia. Um, so you know, maybe we should check uh, what the situation is in Audible of Armenia, uh, in case you know we got loads of those nice reviews to reveal. Mm. That's so true. For sure. Uh, anyway, this is a five-star review segment. In order to appear here, you will have had to have, by some means, given us a five-star review. Phil has, on this instance, uh, suggested that it will be audible. It's quite wrong. It's Apple Podcasts of Australia. Uh, we Ooh, do well, terrible. Phil. I know. We do well, Phil, in the Australias. Uh, not that Australia necessarily works. I mean, are there islands outside of Australia that are themselves also Australia? Um, they got that the- one where they put people, haven't they? That, that's that's Or is that... Technically that not that Australia. was Australia, where we we yeah. we put people. Uh, no, but I think the, they've the, got their Tasmania. own where they put people. Or is Tasmania uh, Australian? Well, yeah, I, I'm going to say yes. I believe. Why so. not? There we go. Best to just say that, and we move on with this incredibly ignorant moment. Uh, <laughs> the point is, is it's come from Apple Podcasts of Australia. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, to all of our Australian listeners, specifically this one, uh, old Tapolin one to one. Uh, and if you want to be like Tapolin one to one uh you need only leave us a five star review in a place where you can do so which by all accounts is audible now uh but also our facebook page and also itunes so you know why not go out there and do that and then maybe at some far flung instance in the future uh we will speak these words in relation to yourself and you might get a nice warm fuzzy sense of uh satisfaction i imagine um it's quite nice isn't it when people you listen to call you out on the thing that they do i think have you ever had that happen to you, Phil, in any other walk of life? Mm, oh, I'm trying to think. N- not on radio or other podcasts, I don't no. think. Um, no, fair enough. Fair enough. So never, by all accounts. Well, I was I was mentioned in, I can't remember what it's called, you know, the, the Metro, um, like, I wouldn't say Love Hearts or something. It's like the little, there's, in the Metro newspaper, there's a bit about, like, oh, I, I saw a stranger on the train and this is your description. You were, you were, you were described as a sexy boy on a train. I was, yeah. It, it was done by you know my, my partner at the time. Um, oh, she I put see. One in there. Oh, I see. Nice. So it wasn't that you were randomly spotted as some sexy boy. On the train. Not quite. It was almost like a, a a little bit. It was a predetermined thing. Phil, for 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 all of our collective benefit, can you work really hard to find that anecdote and share it with us in the, in the future instance? <sighs> Um. Yeah. Do you know what? I think it's on my Facebook, so I might be able. To You've it got it in a scrapbook somewhere, Phil. You're the sort of man with a scrapbook. It's in there. I wager. Probably gathering dust yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Much like us going through this segment, it's taken us a while, isn't it? Let's get on with it. So yeah, leave us a five star review if you want to. Uh, also, this is the bit where I remind you that we have a patron. If you'd consider supporting us, that would be awesome. But equally, don't if you don't want to. That is also fine. Uh, additionally, we do have merchandise now and again when we can think of things to put on it. Uh, but there is still some available uh, available online from our friends over at Lee's Thing. I've forgotten the name. Re- of Rev it. Level. Rev Level. Thank you. My mate Lee's thing. Anyway, there we go. Link, um, links in the description. Links in the description. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk about this five-star review. So this comes from Top All in 121 from Australia, and it reads, charming and accessible. Five stars. It's very accessible. Listen, irrespective of 40K know-how. So there we go. Pretty lovely intro there. Essentially in- indicating Phil that if you aren't super swatted up on 40k stuff, you can indeed still listen and or enjoy. Although I do often challenge this assertion when it comes to our recent uh, spree of Codex reviews. I feel like it's gone quite granular. Um, so maybe more can be done to try and uh, live up to this statement. But uh, well, it's I nice mean, to hear nonetheless. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got site difficulties us literally reading through the codex is an accessibility service basically well there you go didn't even think of it like that so we are accessible on multiple levels and charming apparently i'll take that exactly it's very free of the usual content creator faff and it's good painting vibes there you go uh again i feel like over the course hard, of this hard year disagree i disagree I was going to say, I feel like throughout the course of 2022, we probably added a little bit of the usual content creator faff. Uh, notice how we mentioned that we have a Patreon and merchandise. Um, 
but you know it just seemed like the thing to do really didn't it you know you can't just leave that uh leave that opportunity on the table i mean yeah what do you want nord vpn ads instead because that's no, what we don't get. want those nord vpn ads no you know those uh, those live not live reads but like those content creator reads now seem to have to go on for like two minutes at a time or something. I mean that's just too much. But yeah, they're, they're getting pretty out there in terms of the stuff they're promoting. I mean, this is the tightest, you know, six hours in forty k content, mate. I mean, there's just no way I could fit two minutes of Nord VPN into this. It's just not. It's just not possible. No anyway, can, can you just say thanks and we'll uh, move it along? Uh, yeah, th- thank you for your kind words. I'm glad top you found us. Uh, yeah, top all- top all in. I think it's top all in. Top top like. Top. Do, you, do you want me to spell it out and then you can tell me I'm wrong? You'll just be like, no, no, I'll, 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 I'll trust you. I'll just trust all right, you. Fine. I'll, I'll trust you. Yeah, thank you very much, top all in one two one. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for finding us accessible, even though we we maybe not. Thank you for thinking that we're not free of content faff or thinking that we are free of content faff, even though we're, we're probably not. But we do know for sure, 100%, we are damn good painting material. Uh, so once again, let us know in the comments what you painted up while you listened to this episode. It might have actually been T.P. Allen. Uh, might have been one of those. I mean, that, that sounds more like a word. So, I mean, yeah. tarpaulin oh, is still a word. <laughs> it's not one someone normally calls himself, though. I think it's a great name for, uh, you know, I might steal that for myself. But um, it could also be T.P. Allen. Uh, well, thank you, T.P. Allen, if that is your name. Toilet Paper Allen. Hmm. Allen. One, two, one. Anyway, yeah, cheers for that, mate. I really appreciate it. It is super awesome of you leaving us a review. Sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, hopefully one of the versions that we landed upon somewhat resemble what it actually is. Uh, but all things being said and now done, it's time to move on to whatever it is that we're going to talk about first, which will be something from Rift War. What that is, TBD. But you'll find out momentarily. Transitional noise. Woo! <laughs> Welcome back, all of you lovely individuals in this part of the podcast. Myself and Phil will dive into the pages of the Rift War. Uh, are we going to break this down into segments overall before and or maybe more accurately after a general overview? That seems like the way yeah. to do it, right? No, I think so, yeah, because obviously we've got uh, you know Codex Supplements and Armies of Renown, but we can start off with a little general overview of the book. Are we going to review the cover? I was going to say, let's review the cover. It's rubbish. I know that you don't like it. It's rubbish, Phil. Rubbish cover. One out of ten. No, that's not fair. 0.5 out of ten. Ooh. No, no, no. It's not that bad. I mean, it's bad. It's the worst cover in all of 40k. It, it's very dark and it's not very striking. Uh, it's got a lovely I, arrow, though. I suppose I, quite, I like the arrow motif that's used to, you know, clip out some of the some of the artwork to to, to crop it per se. Um, yeah, but, but isn't the artwork that, quite nice though without the arrow? Let's observe on page. Oh, it's not easily identifiable. Normally, with these things, you can find the full cover artwork within moments. Of opening it. Oh, here it is. Oh, no, it's rubbish either way. Oh, God. It's so just page him. page 10. Yeah, page 10. Him floating over some spaceships. And a person. In a, in a rib Or was cage. it another spaceship? Might be another ship, actually. Yeah, there's just multiple spaceships flying through a rib cage. Like like a sort of like a, a slab of meat, as it were. It looks like a, a cow hide on its side. To illustrate the warp, and then there he is. What's the name of that guy again? Harkin Mc... World Claimer. Harkin World Claimer, the most awful of uh, of characters. All right, well there you go. Yeah, awful. That's my review. Don't like it at all. What do you reckon, Phil? Um, it, it, it's below average for sure. I wouldn't <laughs> below quite say. Average. Wouldn't say awful. I, I'm more offended by the fact that they've once again changed their numbering and naming convention for the book so oh, yeah. it's not it's not act one or act two book one book two it's just warzo knackmond rift war uh so that you don't actually no it wasn't a, well, go on. well it was sort of established because the first one was just 
you know, Warzone, Nackman, whatever the last uh, one was. Vigilus alone, yeah. Yeah, so now it's just, you know... This is, this uh, okay, is... but if you've got those two books together, how do you know which order you meant to read them in? You, you don't. don't. You don't. No, you've just, no, got to know, yeah. you've just got to know, right, yeah. that one precedes the other without any identifier or numbering whatsoever. So that I find quite annoying. You could, um, uh, you know, put a little little bookmark in it or something you could go you know add extra steps to... well well you are correct there is once again no bookmark in here. i didn't say that, that there is no bookmark i was simply suggest. well i mean there is no bookmark but i was suggesting merely that you could use some kind of bookmark as a means of understanding it's uh it's time and place yes yes you could i mean it's fair to say that these books i mean we buy them uh because we're lucky enough to be supported by our lovely patrons that allow us to do this uh silly nonsense uh, so we buy it purely so as we can talk about it. But it's fair to say that even, I think, if you had bought this with your own real monies, right, had you done that, I think you still wouldn't care about it a week or two after it's come out. Like, these books feel like the most disposable thing in Games Workshop. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I, I will give it credit. So I've read, I've read right. the law pages. <gasps> well, this and is actually, good. Give us the overview. It's a good story. It's is it? so yeah. Vi- Can I so guess vi- what it's about? Having not read it. Okay, go on. I'm just going to look at some pictures and some maps quick. Right, Warzone Nackman. There's knights in it, but they're chaosy knights by the looks of things. Um, and there's some pictures and swirls, and then there's a weird image of some tyranid bits. Is that right? Are those tyranid bits? Anyway, oh, and Black Templars. Okay, fine. So here we go. This is my estimate. Matey boy on the cover that I don't like very much. Harkham World Glamour. Harkham World Glamour is running around going, I like Abaddon. Hey, everybody. Abaddon's my best friend. Have you heard? Oh, we're great pals. And then he's gone to the Rift wherever that may be, he's caused some nonsense. And in the doing of, he's conjuring a thing and it's sent out like a psychic thing and the Nids have been attracted to it. And then it's near guard and they're trying to stop it. And then because, ah, we don't like this very much, Black Templars. There you go. Did I get it right? Uh, the first part was correct. The bit about the psychic beacon and the two Nids, completely wrong. Oh, um, are there even Nids in this thing? No, there aren't. Um, oh, I was let down by the leg picture. What is that leg picture? Uh, page 29, there's like a weird leg picture. Hold on. What is going on on page 29? Oh, um, no, that's Drakari. That's Drakari? Um, oh, okay. Yes, it's the, the, the homunculus, homunculi, I think. Um, oh, right. So, so Vigilus Alone was a bit of a weak story, I thought, which was the preceding book. It was all about how Marnius Caragar has been presumed dead, uh, after his battle with Abaddon, uh, he's been whisked away by the Ultramarines, I presume, back to his homeworld uh, to rest and recuperate. Um, but everyone else thinks he's dead. And then it talks about the uh, conflict on Vigilus is still ongoing. There's still Chaos Warbands there. Uh, but it sets out the wider war, which is all along um, the uh, Nackman Gauntlet. So that is now like a war zone in and of itself. It's actually teeming with not just it's not just a wibbly wobbly corridor through the warp um to get from one side of a great rift to the other it's actually like uh, an entire system with planets on there's um uh, you know forge worlds chaos worlds all sorts of um you know imperial planets along there of great importance and that the fighting is now spread out to all of those um, and there was a bit of a cool story about the Inquisitor that was the um, limited edition store anniversary model, him. He was going around Vigilus, destroying all the Chaos Gates uh, to help stabilise the rift around Vigilus. And that was the only real takeaway from that book that I really got out of it. Uh, there was lots of stuff happening, but kind of a little consequence. This is a bit more of a condensed story in terms of what's going on. So the first bit is basically uh, Abaddon has tasked Harkon World Claimer to take the uh, Nackman Gauntlet and uh, control it, because if they control that, then they control access to the Imperial uh, 
uh, I want to say Sanctus, the normal part of the space, because they're obviously coming from the Nihilus part, uh, which is where Vigilus is, which, as I talked about in the previous podcast, wasn't that well explained because they never really gave it context as to which side of the um, Great Rift Vigilus was actually on. So weirdly, it's on the Nihilus side, not the Sanctus side. So Hagen World Claim is running down the rift with the biggest army and fleet that the galaxy has ever seen, as far as I'm awesome. aware. Um, he's got three different um, sort of vanguard forces uh, leading the way to spread fear and disease and pestilence. And, you know, so he's got like a, a, a plague specialist uh, uh, fleet going off. And then he's got the... Uh, terror troops and the uh, night lords going off in another one and then he's got a, a third one as well so there are different parts of the armies are going off doing all of these different things uh you know you've got the alpha legion uh spreading sort of misinformation and creating uh cults on planets to raise up at the right time uh but the main main conflict there's two in this book the first one is uh daravar yeah daravar which is this uh, Chaos Knight world. So basically they uh, sided with Horus during the Horus Heresy, but weirdly no one noticed. Uh, and they've been worrying and fearing reprisal from the Imperium for effectively 10,000 years, so they've become really isolationist. So they are within the Nakman Gauntlet. Uh, there's a nearby uh, Chaos Forge world, uh, which... Um, that they're aligned with but beyond that they don't really do anything and they just stay on their planet but what's happened is the uh castellans of the rift which is one of the primaris only chapters they've been tasked along with other space marine chapters to form what is called the wardens of the rift which is a bit like uh you know you had the wardens um in that other forge world story that we all liked okay. uh, um you know the one, the one where there's Minotaurs, Red Scorpions, and um, oh, what's his name, Huron Blackheart. Oh, you mean um, oh the Maelstrom stuff, the uh, Badab. Yes, but so Badab War had the uh, Wardens of the Maelstrom, I believe it was. That was it. They, um, it's coming and, together. And they, they've you know repurposed that kind of cool name. So you've now got Wardens of the Gauntlet, Wardens of the Rift, uh, which is a bunch of Space Marine chapters uh, set to defend. Uh, Vigilus and the surrounding area. So they're all besieging Darovar uh, to take it on because it's uh, they've f- sort of suddenly discovered that there's a, this Chaos Night world there and it's going to be a key area for this uh, impending fleet. Uh, Harkon Wellclaimer comes along, uh, relieves the siege or relieves the defenders by breaking the siege and then they all scatter off to uh, the Imperium Sanctus where they uh, create kind of like this this uh, concept of like a wall where they're going to basically do their last stand against Harkon's uh, impending fleet. Uh, and then you've got, hold on, let me flick a few pages along to remind myself what it was called. Uh, so you've got the Sanctus Wall, which is what they were calling it, where they're going to do uh, a sort of last stand. But they need to buy time, basically, to prepare the defences of all these planets and fortify uh, all of them bring in reinforcements um, from other areas. So what you have is the Battle of the Narrow, which is the last big story. Uh, basically, there's a lady who's uh, the Lord Admiral. Uh, she leads a fleet uh, to go and basically fight Harkon World Claimer, knowing that the fleet will ultimately be destroyed, but is a, a delaying tactic, basically, on her part to buy time for the defenders. So you sort of, throughout this story, building up to the boogeyman of uh, Harkon World Claimer coming along, uh, and she needs to buy them time, which they do to an extent, but ultimately most of her fleet is destroyed or scattered by the very end. And then it kind of ends on a cliffhanger of, okay, Harkon World Claimer is going to breach uh, this Sanctus Wall and is about to, you know, head into the main part of the Imperium. And that's kind of where it ends on a kind of a bit of a cliffhanger, I think. Uh, but I found it very interesting anyway, is my uh, overall synopsis of the actual story. If that at all made sense to you. I mean, no more sense than it did before necessarily. No, it did. I mean, it made plenty of sense, mate. No, it was a good uh, solid explanation 
Uh, oh, or... and then there was there was one extra bit where we talked about uh, the picture of the Jokari, which was this weird throwaway bit that, that sort of got added in sort of at the end, where basically uh, one of the Jokari leaders tricked an entire world into thinking he was going to save them from, uh, I think, the orcs, of all things, because he basically led some orcs to attack a planet, and then he rocked up with his Jokari at the last minute to save them all, and was like, oh, we can lead you to a a new home come with us and end up basically in saving an entire planet to go back to Gamora. Um, Classic was, Drakari. I know, exactly. It was kind of a cool story, but it's like, okay, this has nothing to do really with the rest of it other than to sort of say, yes, within uh, the Nackman Gauntlet, there are lots of pirates and raiders and other Xenos activity also happening in addition to the main chaos threat that's coming down um through the gauntlet but beyond that it doesn't really connect to the main bit of the story very well and this story doesn't really tie in with anything from the previous book so the inquisitor doesn't show up again there's no real references from any of the characters from that book in this book they're very sort of almost distinct stories that don't really tie together so that would be my one negative about the story um but otherwise it was actually the one i enjoyed the most for at least a couple of books so, you know, because after the last one, Vigilis Alone, I was a bit like, okay, these books are getting worse and worse. This one mm-hmm. actually was exciting to read. Um, uh, well, that's so positive to hear. Yeah. They, they I are, thought you did I... a good job of explaining it, though, Phil. Okay. I mean, it, it, sound, it sounds like typical Games Workshop filler. Um, you know, relatively insignificant character gets together with the biggest fleet since fleets began and gets up to some mischief it's like oh yeah cool standard um yeah the, the, and at the mean, end nothing has happened <laughs> well yeah i was like is this okay because is this building up to is this going to be the big story of temp edition like is it going to be the chaos fleet attacking imperial sanctus as part of like a bigger storyline um, I mean, some of the other Warzone books also didn't tie up neatly, so they can always revisit them, I guess, and carry on their story. Part of me is a bit like I'd just rather it be a contained, like, start, you know, beginning, middle, end. And it's like, cool, there's no more to it. Great, we can park that one and create a new Warzone yeah, to, yeah. to play around with in future, rather than something you keep going back to. I don't mind them revisiting Vigilus as like a sort of because it was very iconic when it first came out. Agreed. As a sort of time and place and story that everyone got involved in. So coming back to it's quite cool. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do going forwards uh, with this story. Totally, mate. Look, I think mean, you know ultimately the narrative aspect of these books is always an interesting additive and something that I guess a few people um, are engaged with. I think overall. The, uh, you know, modern 40K narrative to me is always a little bit kind of uh, underwhelming because it. I think the thing is about old 40K, this becomes a bit old men yells at clouds, to get clouds again. But in old 40K, because they never moved the story forwards, there was always this real kind of looming set of sense of danger, but was, you know, always acceptable because they were never going to get to the point where everything really started kicking off. Um, but I think the problem is now is they've gotten to a point that everything's kicking off and everything's gonna, like end game level craziness, but yet nothing ever happens. It's always that thing where you're like, everyone just gets away. It's like, oh, I was, oh I'm all right now. Don't worry. All the key characters keep living forever. Yes. It's yeah. Like- yeah. I, I do like it that some of the stories have had consequences like the, um, house Raven, uh, Homeworld got destroyed or actually got stolen by um, Bellacor and got transformed into, oh, I can't remember, was that like House Corvid or Cor- Corvid something or other? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and something. is now a Chaos Knight world, which hopefully when we go through the Chaos Knight book uh, will feature in there. And when I remember reading The Last Vigilus Alone, they talked about going to this Chaos Knight world, uh, which is Daravar. And I was like, oh, cool. I bet in the next book, i.e., this one, there'd be either an Armies of Renown or a Codex Supplement for the Chaos Knight Daravar. Is it in here? No. Which seems like a really weird own goal to not do. Uh, So instead you've got the Castellans of the Rift, 
there's a codex up them, which is a cool concept. So it's like, here's how you run, you know, a different form of Primaris Space Marines. That's cool. You've got an armies of renowned the Warped Mailed Pact, uh, which I believe is mostly Thousand Sons. Uh, if you have a I think pretty view. exclusively Thousand Sons, isn't it? Yeah, so it looks, uh, yeah, that's all Thousand Sun uh, related. And then you've also got, God, it's got loads of rituals, uh, Armies of Chaos Undivided, which is Crusade rules. Uh, obviously we you've got a lot of Crusade talking rules. Talking about book, them. And then you've also got what no one asked for, the court- Courtiers of the Homunculi, which is another... Drakari Armies of Renowned, which, as I mentioned, was I think there's basically one page of story talking about what the Drakari got up to and was such a tacked on story. So it feels really <laughs> weird that they've then gone, rather than talk about the main story with the Chaos Night World, we're actually going to talk about these Drakari guys instead. It's almost like uh, the rules writers had a bunch of rules ready to go uh, for Drakari and they went, well, we've got this as well. Ah, it's all right. We'll chuck something in. Bloke turns up, nick some people, pfft, move along. You know, yeah. Classic really, Drakari. Really, really weird in that respect. Um, I mean, maybe the the, the House Daravar will be just actually in the Night Codex, so maybe, doesn't need maybe. its own supplement. But it's a bit odd that it's not in here, considering this is where the story of them uh, is. So um, there you go. I'm sure yeah. the uh, six other people that are reading this story will be deeply hurt i know yeah you're part of a small elite community now phil much like the castellans of the rift which i suppose is what we're going to talk about next but before that we'll do a transitional noise as is the way of things although i should at least offer phil the last opportunity to see if there's anything else he wants to summarize about this book before we get into rule specific stuff Oh, well, I was going to say, I haven't read it all, but the, obviously there's a campaign setting in here as well, um, which has a slightly different twist from the others. You've got a sort of a tug of war game going on with your um, with your war zones. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got three war zones, I believe. Uh, so you've got the surface of Daravar, the Mandel point of Daravar, or Mandevel point of Daravar, sorry. Uh, and then you've got... Uh, the Gradyloid Narrow, which is where the big oh yes, the old Gradyloid Narrow, yeah, which is the the, uh, the last ditch effort to slow down uh, World Claimers' uh, forces are, and basically what you have is like a sort of um, a ladder uh, where you start in the middle and everything's contested, and if you win, you go, you know, you bring that tracker slightly down towards your side where you get some benefits and then if you win another game it goes down even closer where you get more benefits so depending on how well each war zone is doing you can gain benefits sometimes there's choices where you just win victory points for your overall campaign but then sometimes you can go well actually i'm gonna take a bonus which has less victory points but benefits people playing in the other war zones so i like that there's an intrinsically like a bonus linked to all the different war zones so you can't just go i'm going all in on one war zone you need to manage how you and try and win all three war zones not just one which i think is an interesting concept but i mean beyond that it's very sort of samey in terms of you get i think three legendary missions which is exactly how you what you get in all the other war zone books and you know ultimately the kind of the ladder system is just a, a bit of a tweak from how all the other ones are. I think in each book they give you a different kind of way of playing a campaign. Mm. Overall, it's all very similar, I guess. But, you know, some have ladder trees where, you know, if you win, you go to the left or if you lose, you go to the right and, you know, end up playing different missions. Uh, this one's more you, you're playing whatever missions you want. But here's a way of manipulating the overall bonuses that everyone can get for depending on how well their faction's doing. Um, so it seems interesting. Cool, man. Well, no, it's good to know, mate. And obviously, you know, just the added perspective. You have obviously paid more attention to this book than I have up to this point, so I will default to your opinion. Um, cover needs some work. Story seems fine. Let's discover what some of these rules are all about. Transitional noise. <laughs> Do you know what Space Marines uh, need, Phil? 
better rules? Well, I mean, some would argue at the moment they've got pretty reasonable rules. No, Phil, what they need is another Codex supplement. They haven't got nearly enough. So here's another. Good. Another flavour of Space Marine in the form of Castellans of the Rift. Now, if I remember what you said moments ago, these are the happy chappies who came together to look after the bit of space between the the, the thing called the Rift. Well, there's so that's the Wardens of the Rift, the Castellans oh. of the Rift are the actual, they're an actual chapter. Oh, they're an actual chapter. They, they were founded by Rabute Gilliman uh, during the Indomitus founding um, and um, are specifically Primaris only uh, chapter. Well, indeed. So Codex Space Marines describes how Adeptus Astartes units belong to a chapter. And in this case, they are Castellans of the Rift. Uh, I assume they're an Ultramarines. So they they uh, are indeed an Ultramarines successor chapter. Yes. When, oh, there it says it there. There you go. Mm. Those present in Codex Supplement Ultramarines. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so it's an Ultramarine successor, which means that when they're in the Tactical Doctrine, uh, they are able to uh, move and count as if they did not move, which is super handy dandy uh, for some things. Not as good as it used to be, but still got its uses. If you've got a unit of suppressors, if you've got devastator marines if you've got uh things which obviously want to move and would otherwise uh, suffer negatives oh. to hit or or just uh you want to be able to rapid fire because you at uh, full range oh, yeah. because you can do because you're stationary there you go look at you hitting us with all the hard facts well it's because it, it happened to me at uh, rfw so i'm uh, well aware that it can happen there you go, there you go. So Adept Society's units can only be drawn uh, from the Castellans of the Rift chapter if they have at least one of the following keywords. Uh, oh, okay, so the limitations to it. So uh, Gladiator, Impulsor, Primaris, Invicta Tactical Warsuit, Redemptor Dreadnought, Repulsor, uh, Repulsor Executor, and Storm Speeder. So basically, these guys are exclusively Primaris. I'm pretty confident that will incorporate almost every flavour of primaris thing somehow maybe yes. it doesn't include maybe i don't know maybe it doesn't include one specific thing maybe they can't use the um the uh fortification perhaps i don't know i don't know if that's true oh do you know what maybe because uh, the thing is the primaris keyword probably covers most of them the fortification one is interesting because obviously they've called out all the individual it's basically they've called out the primaris keyword which is all the infantry and then each individual um each individual vehicle so you're right the the uh the fortification might fall foul to that although that would form part of a uh separate detachment so you oh, going to be drawn from yes because it would would it be technically unaligned potentially i'm just looking it up now just to have a quick uh a quick nosy at uh at what the uh, fortification is indeed it's for Hammerfall uh, Bunker, isn't it? That does sound like the words. Uh, codex, 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 Codex. Isn't it irritating when you use the incredible Warhammer 40,000 app and all the Codex supplements for Space Marines are at the start, but you have to scroll down um, to actually get to Codex Space Marines? Uh, well, I've just so... searched for it instead. Um, it oh, has right. the Imperium Adeptus Societies and Chapter Faction keyword then it has Hammerfall Bunker Building and Vehicle. So actually, it doesn't have the unaligned keyword, so it can't mm. be used uh, as a Castellans of the Rift, even though it is technically a, a Primaris Space Marine um, vehicle. Bingy. Yeah, no, that's yeah. it. Equally, oh no, no, the ATV is fine. What about the Fire Strike Salvo? Oh, yeah, they can't use Fire Strike um, servo, servo turrets. Oh, so they can't so the, use uh, the defensive stuff. Yeah, so the Tech Marine uh, Fire Strike servo turrets are not usable. Um, eradicators. I mean, have, are... have you ever seen one on the tabletop? Well, no, because I assume that, uh, you know, everyone out there is running Castellans of the Rift and understand the rules extensively and appreciate that they're not allowed to take it. <laughs> But no, no, I mean, there was a time early doors where people were, you know, saying that they were legit awesome. But... Yes, I, I remember Winters had like nine or something mad. Yeah, um, yeah, there was definitely a time where they were, they were, 
you know, a hot, a hot, uh, a hot addition to any army, but maybe not so much anymore. But there you go. I mean, there you go. It's not too terrible. You can't take two things. You can't take fire strike survey turrets and you can't take that bunker, the uh, hammerfall bunker. Yeah. Or obviously first ball uh, space marines uh, of any or kind. Obviously first ball space marines. Can't be using any of those pesky um, centurions. Van- yes. Or, or vanguard vets using primaris models as some people are wanting to do. Indeed. Um, anyway, there you go. Interesting for sure. Uh, some rules in this section uh, refer to Castellans of Arrest Detachment. Uh, this is one that only includes units uh, uh, with Castellans of the Rift keyword, excluding agents of the Imperium and un- unaligned. Okay, fair enough. Uh, interesting set of restrictions, interesting setup. It obviously clearly is a Primaris only chapter, thus, uh, in so doing, you're only able to access Primaris stuff and are restricted as per what we've essentially outlined. Um, so let's hear what the chapter tactic is, Phil. Yeah, so it's unyielding resistance. So each time a model with this tactic makes a melee attack, if a model unit made a charge move this turn, add one to the attack's hit roll, which is pretty I like cool. that. Uh, yeah. And then each time an attack is made against a unit with this tactic, an unmodified wound roll of one to two always fails, irrespective of uh, you know weapons and abilities. So a mini transhuman. I like uh, that too. Yeah. Both pretty cool. Interesting, it's a uh, melee focused, uh, even though Ultramarines tend to be quite shooty, I would say. Well, it's only melee focused in the sense that you're adding one to your hit rolls uh, for melee attacks, but the only being wounded on three pluses is uh, against all attacks, right? So that's not just strictly oh, limited yes, to melee. Yeah, sorry, I just was referring to the first part. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify for people thinking, hang on a second there, is that right? Um, but yeah, actually, I'd, I'd, actually, I'd actually go so far to say that's probably up there as an okay chapter tactic. Um, I think it's actually reasonable, uh, if, if truth be told. Um, I think, obviously, if these guys were White Scars or uh, Blood Angel's successor, it would have been uh, pretty cool, or even Space mm. Wolves, maybe. But, um, yeah, I know. But hey, it is what it is. They've got Warlord traits, Phil. We know we love a Warlord trait. Why don't you tell us about the first one? Yep, so the first one is Hit and Run Master. So again, alluding to a bit of white scarness uh, Mm, going mm. in there. So it's in your command phase, select one friendly Castellans of the Rift unit within nine inches of this Warlord. Until the end of that turn, that unit is eligible to shoot in a turn in which it fell back, uh, which is quite good. Yeah, Yeah. so that's basically the Ultramarines uh, chapter tactic baked in as a Warlord trait uh, with a nine-inch aura as well which is um yeah. and also note as well it says one friendly it isn't being specific in the sense that it's not core and it's not um you know oh, characters it's could, it's anything, could be a vehicle right, right. Yeah, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So if you have a castellan of the rift repulsor it can fall back and shoot to its heart's content which nice is, uh, and there's no negatives to hit for having done so no no, no pretty reasonable uh, exemplar of the chapter, add one to the attack characteristics of your warlord. Yet again, another uh, example of combat prowess. Each time an attack is made uh, against this warlord, an unmodified wound roll of one to three always fails. Blimey, that is strong. So, yeah, Baked got... in transhuman and plus one attack. Ooh. That's Ooh. Quite, quite tasty. That's good. I will give that a... That's pretty good, that. Nice. How about then, the tip of the sword, Phil? Yeah, tip of the sword. At the end of your movement phase, select one enemy unit within 12 and visible to the Warlord until the end of that turn. Each time a friendly Castellans of Rift core unit declares a charge, if the enemy unit is one of the targets of that charge, you can re-roll the charge roll. So you mm. can multi-charge and just, you know, get the re-roll off, uh, which is quite cool. And... Each time a friendly sends a Rift Core model makes a melee attack against the enemy unit, add one to the strength characteristic of that attack. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty good. I think one of the things that's really good about um, these guys as well is that when you've got the plus one to hit, it means that you can uh, get more reliability out of things like chaplains or uh, librarians who I believe... No, actually, is it... No, they're actually weirdly both weapon skill too, aren't they? I think so. Yeah, they yeah. should be. Yeah, they're ballistic skill free weapon skill too, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Something I'm, like that. I'm going to say like yes. That. 
But there might be other characters that you might have considered that might have only been weapon skill free for some reason. Or I can't think of any you've meaningful got things ones. like uh, Thunder Hammers and Power Fists, which can that's reduce true. your weapon skill. Oh, that's actually a very that's a much better point than what I was trying to come up with. <laughs> so yeah, well done you. There you go, hitting it with the uh, the hard facts. Uh, they got relics as well. The first of those is called Murrock's Wrath. Uh, I haven't been formally introduced to this Murrock, but uh, it sounds like an angry chap. Uh, Castellans are a wrist model equipped with heavy bolt rifle only. The relic replaces a heavy bolt rifle and has the following profile. Not forgetting that a heavy bolt rifle is a uh, weapon that can be wielded by a captain in Gravis mm. armor, so yeah. not, not the end of the world necessarily. Uh, range 36, rapid fire 2, so it could be as many as 4 shots within 18 inches or 4 shots when remaining stationary, um, assuming that it still retains its bolt status at that point i assume it would do uh, given that yes, it replaces a heavy bolt rifle yeah so it would uh so strength six minus four one damage i'm a bit surprised to see it's one damage but strength six and minus four is all shades of reasonable um as is four shots but yeah. i mean I, I guess the fact it's four shots maybe they thought two damage would be too much yeah because then it'd be I really mean, good i mean to sort of synergize with what this army was trying to do i guess maybe oh actually no because it's ultramarine so obviously you're going to be able to walk and still remain stationary and blast out all those shots i guess so yeah maybe it's okay yeah unlike that they're clearly very mobile and quite close combat orientated and yeah mm. so that so they've turned a heavy bolt rifle into you know a rapid fire bomb it's kind mm. of cool um, the next one is Primarch's Codex, uh, Cassandra's of the Rift Priest model only. Uh, each time the bearer rolls to see if a litany is inspiring, you can re-roll the result. And each time the bearer recites a litany, add three inches to the range of that litany to maximum that is, 12. That's incredibly strong. Yeah. Rerolling litanies is massive. In fact, actually, rolling a free up with a re-roll, theoretically, is, I believe, better odds than um than uh a two up i think or it's or it's the same or or the difference is very minor i think maybe yeah. um but the thing is is that you could also you, do it on a, 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 a you know chapter chaplain or whatever he's called so it's the, a two up uh, with a re-roll master of sanctity i think is yes. what it is or the, yeah, yeah. That's it. but yeah so you could do that but then you're you know pumping him up with a relic and a warlord trait whereas Potentially, you could just pay the 25-point upgrade, give him this relic, and then you're you know, greatly increasing the odds that you're going to be able to get that um, mm. litany off. Um, obviously, if you really, really, really want to be blasting out those litanies, then by all means, make it a 2-plus re-rollable roll. Um, but the fact you also add 3 inches to the range of that uh, litany is, 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 pretty, um, is pretty interesting. Now, what's the range of it? Normally 6? Depends on the litany, but typically oh. it's going to probably be around six. Yeah, um, it says here to a maximum of nine, so perchance they've got examples that go as far as nine. Thing that's interesting though, as well though, is there are a handful, if not only actually a few, uh, litanies that are actually aura based. Um, so I think um, the one that gives you plus two to charges is an aura, um, potentially. And it doesn't necessarily seem very specific whether it increases the range of the aura or the ability. I think it will, but again, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. Um, but yeah, being able to increase the range of an aura that's giving plus two to charges could be pretty meaningful for mm. an army that wants to uh, get up and fight, especially when, um, yeah, it's getting into plus one to hit and all the other stuff that we've gone through so far. Uh, we've got the Gauntlet of the Imperium, Phil. So this... I assume has to be better than the gauntlets of Ultramar. Uh, mm. Although this is only a single one. Um, so Castellan of the Rift model equipped with a bolt storm gauntlet. Only. Okay, fair enough. So a, a, uh, a, a Gravis captain. Is yes. The, this. the, the new one that came in the last, um, uh, uh, Warzone book. So in its range profile, it's pistol free, strength five, minus two, one damage. I don't know how that necessarily compares. It's also range 12, if I didn't say that already. Um, but I'm going to assume maybe it goes from like pistol two to pistol three, or maybe it's strength five or uh, strength it's, four. It's um, strength four, minus one, one damage. So 
extra strength, extra AP. And then melee wise is times two strength minus three, three damage. Noting that there are no negatives to hit. With this yeah, so melee. you get an extra damage and you lose the minus one to hit. I mean, overall, that's, that's a pretty good series of buffs to a weapon. Um, so potentially a reasonable option. What's the last one, Phil? Uh, so Armour of Furion, uh, which is a Cassellans of the Rift model only. At the start of the fight phase, if the bearer is within engagement range of any enemy units can fight first that phase. Uh, the bearer is eligible to perform a heroic intervention. If it is within six uh, horizontally and five vertically, it can then move uh, six inches. Um, it's got a six inch heroic intervention. <laughs> six inch heroic intervention, yeah, which is pretty pretty tasty. Um, the problem is with fight, fight first. first. Fight first is never as good as making something fight last. Like making something fight last is the gold standard. Yes, because it affects other things that might be in combat with that unit. But instead, this just benefits you as uh, well. That model. But again, it's quite. Yeah. It's still quite a situational benefit. Like fighting first doesn't. It does have some benefits if you're up against things that make you fight last. And like, there's a lot of variables. But yeah. It's not so if you if you were multi charged. And you or you charged multiple units, and then the next turn, two things are going to hit you first. Mm, Actually, mm. you would no, you'd no, have you would to be charged. First. If 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 they if two things charged you, and you had fight last, chances are you can only apply that to one unit, right? So you'd yeah, still yeah. be hit by another unit. Whereas fighting first allows you to attack. Um, well, no, because the controlling player who charged has fight first on the two charging units. Oh, God, it? yeah. Okay, so even when you charged... But you would still go first before one of them. I can't wait to start playing interval. Horus Heresy again, Phil. You know they got initiative. You heard about yeah, this? I, they do, yeah. I'm initiative five, you're initiative four. I'm going first. Imagine. I mean, imagine. Mm. Staggers my, my feeble brain. Um, stratagems, just noticed here, Phil. Potential... Homage uh, to the Gene Sealer Cult uh, cover artwork. Not as good as the Gene Sealer Cult cover artwork, but... It's undoubtedly done by the same person, yeah. It definitely feels like this was uh, a cheaper piece done in a hurry, but uh, <laughs> but still uh, exudes some, uh, some of the qualities. They got to a point where they were like, we ran out of ideas, we need a big picture to fill this empty void. Oh, I, I like it, even if it is like, I don't know, Meatloaf as a space marine. Um, he's rocking a serious mullet, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's pretty cool. Um, the mullet is a thing again, isn't it? Unfortunately so. I mean, it shouldn't oh, be. Don't be, don't be poo-pooing the mullet, Phil. Um, anyway, let's go through these. Um... Typically, as is tradition, we just choose one each from each colour. Well, actually, when it's a codex supplement, we do them all. I know, I know, but I don't want to do them all because I've got too many other things that we're going to do. So we're going to stick to tradition. Oh, screw it, we'll do them all. Fine. You twisted my arm, you there. Um, unfailing nerve, it's one CP and it's a battle tactic. You use a strategy in the shooting phase. When a Castellan of Rift Core unit from your army is selected, shoot. Until the end of the phase, each time one in that unit makes an attack with a bolt weapon... Uh, that targets a unit uh, within half range, improve the arm penetration characteristic of that attack by one. That is a lot of words uh, for plus one AP at half range. Um, mm, that's good. I though. mean, could be good in the Marine matchups now because obviously, you know, being able to neutralize the impact of Armor of Contempt is handy, but obviously it's probably going to be most useful when fighting against things that are not benefiting from armor of contempt or power yeah. armor in general. So reducing the saves even further is good. So fair enough. One CP, not bad. Nice. Uh, next one is let them come. One CP, again, battle tactic. Um, use this stratagem in your fight phase when a Castellans of the Rift core unit from your army is selected to fight until the end of the phase. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, if the unit was charged this turn, add one to the attack's hit roll. So uh... you get... So if you're charged, you get plus one to hit. You so you have to be tactic. charged. Makes a melee attack. Oh, okay, so fine. It's a so typically you stratagem. Yeah, because typically your um your um chapter tactic is when you've charged. So this is giving you the plus one to hit when you've not been, when you've been charged. Yeah. yeah. Which could be fine. plus two if you are um in a ruin, and you set to defend. 
Oh, look at you with the technicality. Although saying that, it 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 um, caps out at plus one, doesn't it? So it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. Unless, of course, they're minus one. Because they've got case, Thunderhammer. still become plus yeah, one. Exactly. There you go. Imagine the possibilities. Uh, unbroken, un- unbound. Unbound? Unbound? And it doesn't matter. Two or three CP, battle tactic. Use a stratagem in your opponent's shooting phase when a Castellan of the Rift Infantry unit from your army is selected uh, as the target of attack. While that unit is within range of an objective marker, each time a model in that unit would lose a wound, roll D6 on a 5+, plus. that wound is not lost. Uh, if that unit has five or fewer models, uh, it costs 2 CP, otherwise it costs 3. It's good. Five or feel no pain out of the blue, sure, why not? Yeah, really good. Very expensive, though. Like, yes. 2 CP for 5 men and 3 CP for... 10 i mean that would be worth it is the thing though Phil, they're not specific about what five men so five gravis yes or it's quite different from five yes. yeah it's quite different from five intercessors no that's true true so, yeah. um push them back for one cp use a stratagem in your shooting phase when a cassandra rift unit from your army is selected to shoot until the end of that phase each time a model in that unit makes an attack that targets a unit within your deployment zone you can re-roll the hit roll uh, so one CP for re-roll the hit roll is pretty good, but they've got to, you know, your target's got to be in your deployment zone, so it's very defensive. Um, yeah, it's good, though, when you can pull it off. Regroup and strike one CP. Use the stratagem in your shooting phase or in your fight phase when you select a Castellan of the Rift unit from your army to shoot or fight until the end of phase. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, if that unit is below its starting strength, improve the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by one. If that unit is below half strength, you can re-roll the wound roll. It's actually pretty reasonable. Wow. If you comboed that with unfailing nerve to you gotta have plus two AP. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. re-roll wound roll. Wow, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah, re-roll wound rolls is pretty meaningful. Uh, yep, then we're on to the Browns, which is an epic stratagem. It's This is our ground uh, for 2CP. Get off my land, basically. Uh, use a <laughs> stratagem at the end of your charge phase. Select one Cassandra Drift unit from your army within range of one objective marker. Uh, until the start of your next charge phase, that unit gains the objective secured ability. Um, if a model in that unit already has that ability, it counts as one additional model. When determining it, you can only use this stratagem once. Um, so yeah, gain obsec for a unit, pretty good. Yeah, or count a five-man unit as ten models for a turn, which is also pretty good. Mm. Um, there's a lot of situations where that's going to be dead handy. So, no fair play. Uh, we're getting into the greens now. There was only one of the uh, one of the browns. So the strategic ploys, 2 CP, use the stratagem in your opponent's charge phase, select one Castellans of the Rift unit from your army until the end of the phase. That unit is eligible to perform heroic interve- inter- uh, interventions, as if it were a character. Uh, that unit is eligible to perform heroic intervention, six uh, horizontally and five vertically. Each time that unit makes a heroic intervention move, its model can move up to six instead of three. There you go, standard. It's all right, 2 yeah. CP. Yeah. Pretty good. And then the last one, uh, also a green uh, strategic ploy, Defense in Depth, uh, 2 CP. Use a stratagem at the start of the first battle round before the first turn begins. Select up to three different Cassellans of the Rift units from your army. Each of those units can make a normal move. They cannot end this move within nine inches of any enemy models or within nine inches of your opponent's deployment zone. If both players have units that can do this, Player taking the first turn moves their units first. You could only use a stratagem once. So rather than using the normal Ultramarines uh, redeploy stratagem, you can just make a move so you can advance into your into no man's land, basically. Oh, which is quite cool. Certainly not too shabby. I think that's a uh, a pretty reasonable ability, all things being considered. Yeah. So I yeah, mean, overall, you could, you could combo that with the uh, Ultra Means redeploy strategy for real shenanigans in terms of, you know, you can move free up and then you could hide free or move those other free somewhere else and then move them up with this. But that'd be a lot of CP. Mm. Mm. I think that's the thing, though, right? I think overall, I would go so far as to say that this is an okay supplement. I think actually. Broadly good. Um, I don't think there's anything extraordinarily bad about it. I think it's got some interesting 
I think it adds an interesting layer of tactical depth. I think, again, for a Marine army to have that kind of emphasis on the extra to hit, it's pretty good. Uh, the whole baked in uh, sort of mini transhuman element, pretty good. Um, and the stratagems are interesting. You know, noting that these guys still have access to all the ultramarine stratagems, all the space marine stratagems, all of that associated war gear and or warlord traits and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is a pretty content and rich uh, force once you start adding up everything it's got access to. Um, but yeah, it, it's all right, man. I think it's OK. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be rushing out to paint an army of space marines in this particular color scheme. But it might be fun now and again to think, oh, yeah, actually, that's a pretty reasonable set of uh, set of attributes. Why not? It, it, it seems like a good one uh, to me yeah. overall. Uh, I've got to agree with you there. As someone who uh, has a lot of Minotaurs, uh, I like the idea of combat, but I also have an awful lot of Bolter intercessors. This mm. is actually quite a good combo because this is uh, someone that still likes to have lots of bolters and you like to do your shooting, but also you want to have lots of movement and be a bit more aggressive than a standard, let's say, sit back and shoot Ultramarines army. Uh, not that they all do that, but uh, obviously that's the, the trope, I guess. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely tempting because when I heard about this being all Primaris only, I was like, hmm, would this be an interesting way to run my Minotaurs? Uh, potentially. Uh, with the exception that I would have to ditch my captain uh, because he's not Primaris, but he's just modelled to look Primaris. Um, but yeah, otherwise it seems pretty good. Not not. I mean, not broken, but definitely not awful either. A good. I would. Middle I would suggest that your, uh, you know, your captain is Gravis enough that you could uh, try and get away with him just being a Gravis captain as opposed to. Uh, as opposed to him being a jump pack regular captain. Mm. But again, I mean, you know, ultimately it seems like a little bit of a stretch, but, you know, yeah, no more necessarily than what you've done already, sort of, maybe, probably not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no Primaris uh, Gravis captain with a Storm Shield. I mean, mm. there is mm. a Blade Guard captain with a Storm Shield, so I could say he's that, but yeah, a bit weird because he's got a very obvious jump pack on him. Well, indeed, indeed. But yeah, no, overall, man, it seems like a pretty reasonable book for what it is. Um, I don't necessarily, yeah, as I say, I think it's fine. Um, I think always the issue with um, these particular supplements uh, is the notion that I always worry that there is a, 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 a kind of finite layer to it. It's always that thing where it's like, if you've got Marines and you can run them like this and people are happy to let you do it. So like in your case, if you wanted to run your minor tours as this, personally, I would be fine with you turning around to me and saying, oh, I'm running my own minor tours as Castellans of the, uh, the, the, of the rift, the rift. You know, if you told me that, I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Sure. Of course, no drama, but I can imagine there might be some who might be a little bit like you, you what? it has to be like that color scheme and, and whatever. I don't think you'll uh, experience that too often, but, I think that's the thing. It's like my problem with this sort of stuff always comes down to like, I want to build something in the moment that reflects these cool rules. But then certainly at this time in the kind of 40 K life cycle, probably by the time I finished painting up a force of these guys, they will have another, another two Marine books will have come out and this will have <laughs> yeah. been but, rendered completely obsolete. Well, you know? well, yeah. I mean, even without that, those books coming out, which they no doubt will, um, this book will probably have a life expectancy of a year at most. Oh, if that, that is if that. what they've done on all the others. Um, so it is understandable. But then if, you know, if that gets superseded, okay, they lose these rules and probably don't have a replacement, say. Um, but then you can just go back to picking and choosing whatever sort of supplement you want them to run them as. Uh, you do make an interesting point, though. So my minor tours, I run them as a White Scar successor. No one has a problem with that because White Scar successors can look like anything. However, this is already a specific successor. It's like me saying my minor tours are Crimson Fist. And it's like, well, they're obviously not Crimson Fist. But, uh, and they can't be Crimson Fist successors. So they couldn't really be painted in a different color like crimson this a bit like black templars sort of have to be black templars like they can't really be anything else mm. um so mm. i do i understand your point about how actually you can't really get away with running them 
as a different color scheme than w- what they should be really uh, whereas if they were just if i'm saying i'm just running an ultra mean successor uh it's, it's fine right a, a nondescript one doesn't matter yeah like i say all the time it's a uniquely space marine problem um but hey it is what it is uh you accept it and move on um much like i suppose we will because that is us having done spoken about these lads we're going to move on now to another rift wars inspired segmentation uh i don't know what that's going to be because me and phil are going to talk about it while not recording so you'll find out in a moment although again it'll probably be on the description somewhere if you're really that keen um but hold on just a moment you'll find out soon enough transitional noise coming back at you like cleopatra you remember that uh show phil you know cleopatra it was a song yeah it was a song performed by cleopatra i guess so yeah the musical group much like warp meld pact i imagine that could be the uh sort of name that you might associate with a popular recording artist of the modern era. Mm, indeed. No doubt one of those ones with tattoos on their faces, I imagine. <laughs> I mean, that's certainly a possibility. I don't know what the general kind of, uh, you know, position is with regards to those who adorn tattoos upon their face. I feel like you need to achieve a level of, uh, you know, opulence, essentially, to start face tattoos. Either you are someone who, from the outset, has very little concern uh, for financial gain, or you have ample quantities of it. Those seem to be the two variables by which face tattoos occur. Mm. At least in the modern context, you know? Yeah, I can... Accepting that there are always variables. Who could say for sure? But what is a warp mail pact, Phil? I have never heard of it. Well, well, I haven't either, and I've read oh, okay. the story. So, but I've just briefly read the very small synopsis, and okay. um, it says uh, that basically they specialize in mutagenic powers and unleash them upon their foes, uh, turning them into chaos spawns at Zangles, and worse, many Zangles join them. So, obviously, they like the Zangles, I suspect. Um, what mail so, pact? The secret of the ooze. Yeah. So, as, yeah. But, but again, a bit weird that it doesn't really seem to relate super with the um, with the story. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So in the story, do the Thousand Sons make a bunch of mutant spawn then? No. As far as I'm... From what I remember, they don't really make much of an appearance. I think maybe they're one of the three different um, vanguard forces used by Hark and World Claimer. Um, oh, okay. But beyond that, I'm just trying to think. Hold on, Vanguard Onslaught, he talks about. Um, yeah, so there's the Purge, who worship uh, Nurgle. There's the Shrouded Hand and the Sinister Terror Lords. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's any of those, to be fair. Oh, wait, here's one. And another, a full band of Thousand Sons, known as the Reflective Ones. Um, oh, I mean, but that's one of many. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. During their assault, the full brand sorcerers weave mutagenic spells and saw many of the garrison of stormtroopers turn to chaos spawns. Okay, so they get like a, a sort of a paragraph um, in in it, and they, they not just a paragraph, to Phil, though a whole them. army of renown. Well, also from, from I mean, from that one paragraph, they get an army of renown. Comes an army of renown. I mean, I've just moved over to page seventy, and page seventy one does have that rather pretty picture of uh the old sorcerer which is uh, yeah that's like a proper old school like 90s bit of artwork i'd assume yeah, yeah, it looks yeah, like I've... it looks like it's on a band cover i genuinely think that is proper old that piece of artwork i think that is yeah the time of 90s I mm, it does look i couldn't it. necessarily go so far as to say I mean, it might have been early 2000s. It might have been one of the fourth or fifth edition images that were doing the rounds, but it's really pretty. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's clearly painted and not digitally, and I think that's the thing that sort of dates it, but it, yeah. it, in a period of time, because people wouldn't do that nowadays, even though they do look damn good. Oh, I agree. I miss when paintings were painted, you know? It's a, 
a beautiful kind of thing where you can mm. see all this incredible artwork where people have obviously crafted it all by hand, as it were. It always feels like with modern CG artwork, there's a level of perfection that these artists can achieve that, in my opinion, sort of robs it sometimes of some of its character. You know, obviously there are great artists who create great work irrespective of the medium, but I do kind of like a a proper old painting with all of its foibles, you know? Yeah, I'll do there that. You, go. You, you managed to get that out after the yawn there, Phil. You're feeling tired already? Oh, well, it's, it's quite late. It's true, it's true. I had a nap between uh, segments. I literally fell asleep for all of I, five minutes. Well, I did wonder where you'd gone for some time. Well, you know, I I, I, I went and I lied down and I had a little nappy nap. Uh, and now I'm back fresh and fancy free. Ready oh, okay. to... Well, I mean, if I'd have known we were having a 15 minute, 20 minute break, I could have had a nap as well. But You could yeah. have done, you could have done. I mean, to be fair, you could have done what I did, which is, you know, take matters into your own hands. Have the nap, and then, uh, and then you know, have your partner deal with the consequences of said I'm, action. I'm, I'm, I'm too much of a team player, though, Dan. That's my problem. That is your problem, Phil. You're such a mug. <laughs> anyway, much like Magnus and all the Thousand Sons, what a bunch of mugs. Um, right, okay. So, Army of Renown, Phil. What are the deals with Army of Renowns? They're basically, as I understand it, and please, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. They are the thing where you build an army, but it has to adhere to the restrictions, but in return gets benefits. But unlike things like uh, supplements, you can't just go, this is a detachment of the thing, but there's other stuff in the army. When it's an army of renown, it all has to be the thing, right? Yes, it's uh, it's army wide, and weirdly, we had some restrictions in the Codex supplement for Castellans of the Rift, which is kind of a weird exception because normally they don't. But obviously, they're themed because they're Primaris only. Uh, but that wasn't an armies of renown. This is so you'll have a bunch of restrictions. It's not just to a detachment; it's for army wide, basically. As beautifully you know, put, as it says on the side of the tin, so they to are. speak. I mean, not this tin specifically, although I imagine there is a section somewhere that reiterates what an army of renown is. Um, I just can't immediately see it here. Oh, it's page 68, apparently. No, we're on uh, page 68. Oh. Uh, There is, I think... uh, Hold on, just a bit before. Oh, yeah, it even says it in the restrictions. All units in your army must uh, have Thousand Suns keywords. Yes, but if you really want to know, on page 55, there's a brief bit about an armies of renown. There we go. I knew there was a bit somewhere about something. I knew I wasn't crazy, Phil. You tried to make me think I was crazy. Yes, yeah. Uh, Shall shall, shall I get on and do the restrictions? You may as well, Phil, because, I mean, it sounds like you're you're excited about the prospect of that nap we were talking about moments ago. No, I know. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Um, So, as a restriction, your army cannot include any named characters, so no madness. What? You can't take Uh, Araban. I know. All units in your army must have a Thousand Sun keyword. Uh, Your army cannot include any vehicles, demons, or Thousand Sun cultist units. Um, hmm. oh, okay. That's very right. restrictive. No, I know. Uh, your army cannot include any units that know any psychic powers from the Disciples of Vengeance. I don't know which one um, that refers to. Come uh, on, Phil. Touch... Disciples of Vengeance. How do you know what? not know what that is? Uh, oh, it's Discipline of Vengeance, not uh, Disciples of Vengeance. Sorry, Disciplines of Vengeance. How do you not know what that is? I mean, I don't. And don't, I'm not an avid Thousand Suns player. Uh, wait, but there's more. So detachments in your army do not gain the mere servant's ability. See Codex Thousand Suns. Again, I don't, I don't know what that one is either. God, I'm going to have to get I, out the I, app, aren't I, and look that yeah, up? I'm afraid so. Um, but then uh, there's one last one as well. So your army must include more Bray units, um, which are the Zangles, uh, than the total number of Rubric Marines and Scarab Occult Terminator units in each detachment. So this is a uh, uh, Zangle-heavy list, basically. Um, But that's a bit like the uh, Terminus S1 for uh, Death Guard. I think you had to have... Ooh, did you have to have more cultists than uh, Plague Marines in that one? I believe you did. Or well, not you cultists, um, the Poxwalkers. zombie guys. Poxwalkers, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, the mere servants is in relation to cultists. So you can't have more cultists than you have uh, Rubik or Scarab Occult. But obviously in that instance, they're basically saying you can't have cultists. Hmm. Okay. In case I suppose there was some loophole where you might be able to do it through some weird set of circumstances. But that do we know is not possible. what the discipline of vengeance is? The discipline of vengeance? I'm glad you asked, Phil. It is a discipline concerns predominantly vengeance so you know when people do things to you and you want to get your own back if you know the discipline of vengeance then um then, then you're probably quids in mm. i guess the the key here is you can't include units that have it so what units have it or is it you have units that have a choice of disciplines but you, and you just don't take this one yeah, I just looked up Discipline of Vengeance and it's not in here. So I'm going into Thousand Suns and then I'm going into what? Psychic Powers? Uh, yeah. Psychic Powers. Psychic Powers. Discipline of Vengeance, Psychic Powers. Okay, fine. So it's things like Gaze of Hate and Presage. It's a bunch of different Psychic Powers, Phil. Okay. Um, do you want to go on talking about the benefits? Why not, eh? So once you've observed all those restrictions that I've already forgotten about, uh, all units of your army gain the Warp Meld Pact keyword, which I assume is what enables you to do stuff. You have access to the Warp Meld Pact Warlord traits, Relic Stratagems, and Kabbalistic Ritual. Um, see Codex Thousand Suns. Um... Units in your army do not gain the Brotherhood of Sorcerers ability. See Codex Thousand Sons. Do not gain the... Okay, I mean, that's quite a fundamental rule to how their army works, but fine. Um, Exalted Sorcerers, Infernal Masters, Sorcerers, Angors, and Chaosborn units in your army gain the Touched by Zench ability. See below. Zangor units, excluding character units in your army, gain the Core keyword. Okay, fair enough. And Zangor Shaman units in your army gain the Strength of the Bray Herd. Uh, touched by Zench is models in this unit have a 5 plus invulnerable save. Each time a model in that unit would lose a wound as a result of a wound uh, of a mortal wound, they don't do so on a 5 plus. Uh, and at the start of the fight phase before the first turn begins oh, sorry, at the start of the first uh, battle round I don't know where I got fight phase out of that. I mean that's pretty fantastic level of assertion. Um, anyway, before the first turn begins, models in this unit make a normal move of up to 6 they cannot end this move within nine of any enemy models. Okay, so you get pre-game move. That's pretty good pre-game move, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting because some most abilities like that have a thing where you can't move within nine of the deployment zone. This doesn't have that restriction. Uh, so I believe of a map, I can't remember which one it's called, it's ones where you do table quarters, but there's a um, circular gap in mm, the middle yes uh with that one i think you can actually get closer to nine inches via uh this pre-game move um solid it, uh, as you were pointing out earlier that they don't get the capitalistic ritual that's the one you always complain about that you hate so you know if you were a thousand suns player this might be the thing for you because that's the one where you've got to keep track of it, the points that each uh, unit, yeah, that's socket true. unit generates uh so this might be a, a more, a more i don't necessarily feel like you. I don't necessarily feel like I hate it. I just find it weird and confusing. Well, yes. So if you want to avoid it, is what I mean. This yeah, is yeah. the way to go about it. No, that's fair. That's fair. And in terms of strength of Bray Herd, uh, at the start of the psych phase, if this unit is within six of friendly warp mailed pack Zangor units, those combined, uh, whose combined model count is 15 or more, this unit generates one additional Cabal point. You just oh, told so, me they don't generate Cabal points. So, well, okay, so... Where's the bit that ignored it? Um, units in your army do not gain the Brotherhood of Sorcerer's ability. Mm, and then where yes. was the bit about Cabalistic Ritual? Cabalistic Ritual... Oh, no, it says that they do have access to it. I thought you said they didn't have access to it. I forget what I said now, Phil. There's any there's any number of possibilities. Okay. I'm, so, I'm dealing so, with my COVID brain. It, it doesn't okay. work anymore. So so redact what I said. They do get access to capitalistic rituals. Oh, so no, it's awful. It, I hate that, it Phil. Worse. I hate yes. it. Mm. I don't hate um, it. I just dislike it. 
And there is uh, a difference. But you don't gain the Brotherhood of Sorcerers ability, which, which is, is a good ability. That's plus one to psychic tests, yeah. And Arcane Astartes and Zangors get a five plus invulnerable save, but then they give you the five plus invulnerable save back. Uh, but it also affects. Um, Oh, so it doesn't affect your normal uh, Arcane Astartes, but instead it, all your Sorcerers, Zangors, and Chaos Spawn gain it instead. So you're shifting who gets your own button save, basically. Yeah, it's weird, because then it's basically your character Zangors and Spawn get a pre-game move. Your characters probably don't want it, cause you, unless you're moving your screens. But your screens are basically... Zangor. basically it's a zangor list right like all your, all your good stuff acts around your zangors not your uh, thousand sun warriors what i enjoy phil is how much of a mess these segments are when we are dealing with army lists that neither of us play or have any degree of kind of you know consistent play against um we always manage to style it out in the best of ways i don't think people could even tell that we oh, don't yeah. know anything about thousand suns um I mean, oh, Richard's got some Thousand Sons. He's he's not he played them for years. Exactly. Richard has some 5th edition, sorry, 6th edition Thousand Sons, um, which are very different from uh, current day Thousand Sons on account of the whole I generate a load of various points for various things in various ways, shenanigans and so on. Anyway, let's move on, Phil, and talk about these their Warlord traits, shall we? Uh, yeah. Oh, a singular uh, warlord trait, Rob. Yes, there's this one. It's the manipulator of reality. Um, I, I guess technically you should be talking about this one, right? Well, I just did the whole. Oh, did you do the last one? Spot. Oh, it's me. I did. Okay. Yeah. Do you uh, even so, know what's going on anymore, Phil? Are you all right? Um, do you want to? I've got. Do you want to I've take got, a break. I've got your COVID brain, clearly. Um, hey, clearly, I think we both got the COVID brain. I genuinely, I do, am genuinely starting to believe that I have. Uh, Quite a bad case of uh, like you know short term memory loss post COVID. I think I think that's just you're old now. Welcome to the is that club, what it Dan? is? It's because it you happened just... as I was transitioning into becoming an old fart. No, it's, it's got nothing to do with COVID. It's just you're old and you, your brain's clocked. That's what over. I'm saying. Yeah. Oh no! Am I am I on the am I on the decline? Am I on the other side of the hill you now? Are. Soon you won't be falling over. You will be having a fall. Uh, which is what happens Indeed. to people of a certain vintage, uh, shall we well, say? Yeah. Anyway, we, but we soon. can change things. We've got the we can be the manipulator of reality. Maybe we can oh, pretend we that you are young again. Uh, I mean, so, uh, I think that would be difficult for. Well, that would be really difficult for me to do of all people. But uh, maybe I could try and uh, convince people externally. But I, it takes some work. I know. Well, we'll try, try, but let's see what it actually does, shall we? Uh, so, at the start of the first battle round, after any units from your army have performed any normal moves as a result of a touch by Zinch ability, you can select up to three friendly Zangor units, remove those units from the battlefield, then set them up anywhere on the battlefield. It is wholly within your deployment zone. The mission you are using uses strategic reserves. You can place those units into strategic reserves instead without having to spend any additional CP, regardless of how many units are already in strategic reserve. Okay, so you get a free redeploy after you've done all your pre-game moves, uh, and you can stick them in strategic reserve. That's pretty good. It's all right. All right, that, yeah. You know, I like redeploys. Uh, They are handy-dandy, so, yeah, fair enough. Not too shabby, I would uh, go so far as to say. So, fair play to them there. Uh, They've got a relic. If your army is led by a warp meld packed warlord, which presumably it must be, given the fact that that's how this army works, uh, you can, when mustering your army, give the following sorcerous arcane relic uh, to this uh, warp meld packed character. And that is Diamond of Distortion. Zangor Shaman model only. In your command phase, select one friendly warp uh, meld packed Zangor or warp mail pack Chaos Spawn unit within nine of the bearer until the start of your next command phase. That model uh, in that unit have a four plus invulnerable save. I mean, being able to boost an entire unit's uh, invun up to four is always pretty handy. Mm. I'm not entirely sure what it means within the context of Zangors because they never strike me as being extraordinarily potent, but 
irrespective, having a four up in run is always useful because um, I presume they must have a five up in run under normal circumstances. So yeah, yeah so they give a, they give a five bad. up from the uh, touch by Zinch rule. Mm. Uh, which then becomes a four up. I, I'm surprised they don't get one by default, but they're not demons, are they? Per se, no. in the same way that um... demon esque, but they're zenchi, aren't they? Yes. That, like, yeah, yeah. Up I, I, I do seem to remember because um, you get sangles on discs, right? The, the little and their bows or something. I remember the rays or whatever it is. When, yeah. when we looked through them, they were really tasty, actually. So you they know, seemed all right. Yeah, they seemed all right. Um, it's not just on foot ones. You could do the disc guys as well. Could get it as well, I'd assume. Uh, or chaos spawn. Mm, yeah, I'll do it on his ankle. Um, <laughs> right. So that's the only relic you get. You also get a cabalistic ritual, which is the braid change. It's six cabal points. Use this cabalistic ritual uh, before taking a psychic test for a blessing or malediction psychic power. Uh, when you're taking that psychic test, roll one additional d6. If the result of the psychic test is 10 or more and is not denied, select one friendly Zangor unit within 9 inches of the psyker manifesting the psychic power. If that unit has the Bray keyword, return up to 2d3 destroyed models to that unit with their full wounds remaining. Otherwise, return up to d3 destroyed models to that unit with their full wounds remaining. Okay, so it's like a, a boost to a psychic power that allows you to return models, uh, which is pretty good. Bearing in mind, so if you've got, according to the strength of the Brayherd rule, uh, at the start of your psychic phase, if this unit is within six of a friendly warp meld packed Zangor, units whose combined model count is 15 or more, this unit generates one bow point. Uh, so you need probably quite a lot to quite a lot of Zangor to generate your Cabal points. Yeah. Um, obviously your other things also generate them, like your uh, your sorcerers and stuff. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, it seems all right. I mean, I don't know. We'll get to my closing thoughts on it at the end, I suppose. But in the mere me mint, it seems all right. I mean, yeah. Let's uh, see what the stratagems are, and then we can make a more broad assertion around the viability of this. Uh, so we have the first of our blue stratagems, uh, Reality Unbound. Use the stratagem in your shooting phase uh, or the fight phase when a warp mail pack Zangor enlightened unit from your army is selected to shoot or fight. Until the end of the phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack uh, with Fate Cast Great Bow or Divining Spear, improve the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by two. Wow. Okay. Improving an armor pen characteristic by two for one CP is huge, especially when you consider the potential size of those units. So, yeah, wow, that's that's pretty strong, I would assert. I'm going to now actually have to look up while you potentially read the next of the uh, the stratagems, Phil, what the deal is with these uh, with these uh, Zangori. So the Zangor Enlightened um, is a six-man unit, or three, three to six-man unit. Uh, and they're armed with... Uh, so the Divining Spear is a close combat weapon. Plus one strength, minus one AP, two damage. And the Fate Caster Great Bow, range 30, assault one, strength five, minus one, one damage that will become minus three damage uh, and they ignore the lookout sir rule yeah, um, yeah. And each time is made with this weapon an unmodified hit roll of two is always successful including overwatch as well which is pretty mad um yeah wow it's, i mean it's um, assault one right so it's not extraordinarily abusive because essentially yeah. a six person unit is getting six shots and they're only it doing is, one damage each, but when they're minus three, it's not too shabby. Yeah, it is odd that with their ballistic skill is three pass, but then their only melee up sorry, their only shooting weapon effectively makes it a two plus. It's like, why don't they have a two plus ballistic skill then? Um very odd. I guess it's to make it clear that it's the magic bow that is super good at targeting and not their natural innate skill at shooting with bows. I mean, I guess that was seemingly important to clarify, but uh, 
maybe not necessarily as important a thing as uh, yeah as people think. Anyway, next of the stratagems, Phil. Yep, so Zangor Onslaught uh, for 1 CP. Uh, use this stratagem in your fight phase. Select one uh, warp meld packed Bray unit from your army. Until the end of that phase, each time a model in that unit makes a pile in or consolidation move, it can move up to an additional 3 inches. So that's a 6 inch pile in and consolidation. That's really good because that gives you a lot of movement options. Yeah, yeah improving your. Um... Yeah, improving your combat movement is pretty significant, so that's pretty strong. Gift of Change, Epic Deed, 1 CP. Use a stratagem in your psychic phase uh, when an enemy character unit is destroyed. Uh, set up a new warp meld packed chaos spawn unit from your army on the battlefield within six of that unit and not within engage range of any enemy units. That chaos spawn unit con contains one model, and if you are playing a game that uses points limit, does not cost any reinforcement points. If your army, uh, if you are playing a crusade game uh, at the end of the battle, that chaos spawn unit is not added to your order of battle. You can only use this stratagem once per battle. So you get one free spawn. Well, you get one spawn for one CP per game. Um, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's a nice little addition. I mean, at the end of the day, can be fun. I don't think spawns are nearly as terrifying as. Uh, they may have been in other editions, but um, it's still an annoying thing to have scuttling around, causing uh, causing headaches. Yeah, especially when they give you a five up in one save on them now, um, and you know, uh, have five up feel no pain because they yeah. get the t touched by zinch uh, rules. Uh, yeah, it's super thematic. I remember stuff like this used to be baked into the rules of of yesteryear. Um, when you killed stuff with the what was it like it was like some kind of um, a boom uh, stick not a boom stick but a boon that you could get oh god if you go back far um, enough yeah so there was the uh, there was the um, sword of change I think is what it was called well there was yes. the staff of change and the sword of mutation I think it was called so it was a, a demonic weapon that you put on your demons uh, and yeah when they successfully killed something on a d6 roll um they turned it into a spawn uh, which yeah. was super fun and i think um, there was even a chance where if you rolled awfully you could yourself turn into a chaos spawn as well but uh, i think quite that was, less unlikely though that was to do with chaos space marines boon of mutation ability. ah that was it yeah so you, a chaos space marine champions always had to issue challenges um and then when they killed stuff in as a result of challenges you rolled off on the boon of mutation dice uh, table and if you were successful with your boon of mutation, you uh, you gain some benefits, uh, which is always fun. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is also spawn related. So warp meld spawn one CP. This is a requisition stratagem. So this is a red one. The last one was a gold epic deed stratagem. Or brown, as Dan likes to say. Uh, so this one is use this stratagem before the battle when mustering your army. Select one warp meld packed chaos spawn unit from your army and basically gets plus one strength plus one toughness which might not be a huge game changer but kind of cool mm, yeah not bad not bad um blessed transmutations is 2 cp use this stratagem in your command phase select one warp meld pack psyker uh from your army you uh for each friendly zangor unit within six of that model if that unit has the Bray keyword, return up to D3 plus one destroyed models uh, to that unit uh, with their full wounds remaining. Otherwise, return one uh, destroyed model to that unit with its full wounds remaining. Always cool to bring stuff back. Not bad at all. Yeah, especially since it synergizes with the capitalistic ritual to potentially bring back more. Um, I mean, you probably can do both every turn. Unless you're mm. generating an awful lot of capitalistic ritual points, but it'd be cool if you could. Um, next one, also a strategic ploy, Twisted uh, Mirage, uh, 2 CP. Use a stratagem in your opponent's charge phase when a warp mail packed Psyker character unit from your army is selected as a target of a charge. If that unit is not within engagement range of any enemy units, it can make a normal move up to 6 inches until the end of that phase. Uh, that unit cannot fire Overwatch or set to defend. Your opponent can then select a new target for that charge, so you can kind of run away a, mm. a little bit. Um, I'm sure one of there was like a disc or something. Uh, maybe it's the 
relic disc had that sort of baked in ability as well. Um, potentially, I could be wrong. Um, I seem to think potentially, mate. Wrong. It's not ringing any bells with me. I have to be honest with you. I'm not immediately thinking. Oh yeah, that thing. Yeah, I mean, quite handy. Yeah. Very much so, mate. Very much so. Um, and the last of these is now the ephemeral, 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 ephemeral. Yeah, yeah we'll go with ephemeral existence. Uh, it's one CP. Use a stratagem in your movement phase when a warp mound pack zangor unit from your army is selected to move until the end of the turn. Each time that unit makes a normal move, advances, falls back, or charges, uh, or makes a charge move until that move is finished. Models in that unit can move horizont- horizontally, though models uh, uh, through models and terrain features. They cannot finish a move. My goodness. So they can just phase shift through stuff. Wow. That's pre- to be fair, that's a really nice set of tools um, for the uh, for the for the Zangles. I mean, that's that's a really nice set of tools. And I don't want to necessarily dismiss it outright because I think you could probably do some really fun things with it. It's just that it's such a weirdly specialized army. It's like it's essentially asking us to go out and purchase bucket loads of zangles, which, with all due respect, is not really the thing that I think a lot of people really prioritize Thousand Sons for, right? Like they want that whole kind of legion, that whole kind of, you know, ghost warrior kind of vibe i think the minute you start leaning into the zango element although i acknowledge there's some interesting tools in here and you start restricting access to things like vehicles monsters i just i don't know i don't know if this would be an extraordinarily strong book um upgrade to the the thousand sons but it's interesting i imagine i imagine the sorts of people who like to hoard up with you know a specific optimal unit and 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 really really spam them could probably find some value in this it's just i don't know i can't i can't foresee too many circumstances where i imagine i'll see too many people playing this but maybe someone out there could do some really good work with it it could work really well for people um i'm just, it's just not for me it's not it's not how i would do thousand sons no but i i know i think when we looked through the codex i think we did talk about the idea of there's enough uh, Bray uh, Zangor characters in there to do a Zangor sort of heavy army. It's the same sort of thing of the sort of person that's going to have already have like you know 50 Zangors and barely any thousand sons are the same sorts of people that will have a crew army and almost no Tau. It's that sort of theme, right? And actually, yeah. speaking of which, why has there not been a crew only army of renowned yet? Like, it's just begging for it. Um, surely there's a crew codex coming soon, Phil. That's what I we're mean, holding out we, for. We, we will hope. Because I do remember when we went through that one, there was one of the uh, tower factions was very crew heavy because it was leaning into the allies. Um, yeah, so I'm sure there are be, there'd be a handful of people out there who will love this, but they're probably going to be narrative players, I imagine, with tons of Zangles. Is there a competitive list in here? Oh, I mean, I don't... I think when it came out, a few people talked about it. Like, you know, you get inbound saves and, you know, you get, you got some cool tricks. But as you say, it's very restrictive and it's uh, sort of very limiting for your army build, right? If you got access to some of the more generic units, maybe it would have a bit more play. But, you know, for what it is, it's kind of cool. Um, it's not terrible, but it's, I think the Castellans of Drift one more maybe a bit more bog standard is weirdly more interesting in terms of feels like you've got some more bit more flavor to it this is very like you've got some you've got some cool strategies but there's no like flair to it it's like you got one warlord trait one relic like that to me is super restrictive like if you had three warlord traits three relics to choose from maybe like some cool relics to actually i mean yeah the diamond of distortion is for uh shaman so it is for zangle but it'd be cool if there was like more options um yeah that's my only criticism really more stuff would have been nice yeah it seems fine i mean that's the whole kind of vibe with it it's fine um i think again like i say the, the, there's very real potential that there is a valid competitive reason to want to run this um, but for me, as I say, I think if I was ever entertaining the idea of doing Thousand Sons, I couldn't imagine myself going in this direction with it. 
Um, not that I dislike the addition of Zangors to the Thousand Suns. I'm I'm relatively indifferent to them, but I think overall, I just again, it's it's not really what I wanted from Thousand Suns. I think overall, I was quite disappointed by the uh, by the Thousand Suns book. I was going into it being quite excited about it, and I think in the grand scheme of things, it sort of let me down a bit because I don't know. I I just wasn't expecting it to be quite so yeah Zangor centric, and to see this further emphasize that concept again i just think like it, it to me it's kind of taken them in a underwhelming direction and when you look at how amazing the the death guard range is and when you suspect how well supported and strong the potential world eaters well not potential games which will confirm it's a thing but you know how that world eaters range could potentially look or perform it's a shame that thousand suns have become a little bit kind of uh a little bit lackluster, but I suppose they were the first, so it's only to be expected, right? Um, they weren't. Yeah, it's true. They weren't fortunate enough to be a, you know, box set army like the Death Guard were in Eighth Edition, which I don't think did them any uh, did them any harm, right? Hmm. True. But there we go. Uh, any last closing thoughts on this one before we move along, my friend? Uh, not really. Just it's all right. It's a good. It's all right. It's solid. Exactly. Seems okay. Could be good in a competitive sense. Um, but you'd need to, you know, run loads of Zangors and be the sort of individual who understands how competitive play works to make it good. Thematically, it's not really, as I say, it's not my not my cup of tea. But hey, there we go. It was fun to talk about. Uh, we obviously exposed how little we knew, or at least I exposed how little I knew um, about current day Thousand Sons. But... Uh, I suppose that's par for the course. We're going to move on. Transitional noise. All right then, everybody. Here again to talk about another of the things from Rift War. It's none other than an army of renown. This time for the forces of the Drakari. Everyone loves the Drakari, Phil. They've done no wrong in the world of competitive play. In fact, I would say, go so far as to say they've been a relative non-entity over the last few years of competitive 40k. So good news that they're getting some rules to really buff them up. I know exactly. What more could you want? I mean, to be fair, it, it's more talking points for Pooley and his Real Space Raiders Drakari special only podcast. That's true. They are often, if not always, starved for ways of spinning current 40k affairs into Drakari themed news. So I'm well, supposing it, exactly that they have probably been sealed inside their Tupperware for a good few months now, and they are now going to emerge fresh like a vampire ready to feast on this new rules. And they're going to dine off of this for weeks and weeks, and there'll probably be at least two or three episodes just on this alone. Quite possibly. I believe they put out an episode not too long ago. I remember seeing Paul Lee posting on his uh, Instagram that an episode had come through. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't for the life of me tell you what uh, numeral value was attributed to that episode. Um, but I'm sure it was a riveting addition. Uh, I bet it was. Indeed. I'm not even being mean about it. I like Paul Lee. I think, you know, the Real Space Raiders is all right pod for what it is. If you need to listen to chats about Drakari. Um but, you know, not as good as us, though, clearly. Exactly. The Death Corps of Krieg uh, special podcast. Exactly. That hardly ever now talks about Death Corps of Krieg because they've become we're, we're, a dirty plastic faction. In, in part. But we're, we're just also in hibernating, waiting for the uh, new codex to come out. And then I'm sure I'll you know, be a bit more infused about them. I've just found it here. Real Space Raiders, episode 36. Uh, Rift War homunculus review. So if you want to hear... A better version of this. Go there. Yes, because we're, we're going to talk about it for maybe half an hour tops. So they're probably spin it out for two hours. Oh, yeah. They'll, 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 they'll eke out as much as they possibly can, uh, as is, their, as is their, uh, their right and or want, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was a seamless transition. Anyway, um, let's talk about uh, homunculus... Uh, what's he even say? 
Potteries, coteries. I, I, I think it's courtiers of the homunculi. Oh, but I, courtiers. I'm not, I'm not even sure if that is because I don't know how that word's actually pronounced or spelt. So, I mean, this is what I'm guessing it is. Yeah. Yeah, let's go yeah. with that. Coteries of the homunculus or homunculi. There you go. Very interesting. It's an army of renown, Phil, uh, which means what we already said before when talking about that last army of renown, um, which I've already forgotten what it is. What was the last army of renown we were talking about just moments ago in this very book? It something, was something. Uh, the Thousand, Thousand Sons, Sons Warp Meld Pact. Oh, yeah, that one. So anyway, yeah, so like that, your whole army basically has to be made up of homunculi-themed things, I would assume. Um, because that's how these things work. But why don't you tell us what the restrictions are, Phil, so as we can know for certain? Well, yeah, the restrictions are probably the shortest they've ever been. There's only two, oh. so all units from your army must have a homunculus coven or the blades for hire keyword, and your warlord must have a homunculus coven keyword. So basically, you need to be homunculus. Funnily that, because you're in a homunculi. Uh, armies of renown, so it makes sense. There you go. I mean, it's good that they have extended to allowing Blades for Hire in there, though, at least. Um, that is a, you know, relatively reasonable chunk of other uh, Drakari themed things. Your Incubi, your uh, Birdmen, your. Um, blah, 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 you know, oh, the all ones. the weird, like, animal stuff that you can have. Are they Blades for Hire? What, the Beastmasters? No, I don't know. That's what I mean, are they? I don't know. Now you're asking. I feel like they are linked to the um, the witch cults um, Probably. for some reason or another. But I'm fairly sure that the ones, you know, the ones that are like shadowy. They got mandrakes, that's the word I couldn't find for ages there. They're blades for hire, I think. You can have mandrakes, birdmen, or stabby dudes um, in the form of incubi. Um, so all good. Anyway, there you go. The benefits of having done that, though, uh, are that all units of your army gain uh, the word we've struggled to pronounce of the homunculi keyword. Uh, you have access to homunculus coven warlord traits, uh, st stratagems and relics. Uh, and then keyword homunculus coven units in your army gain driven by fear ability, which is just below... Uh, and I suppose it's only correct that I read what it is. This unit never gains a Drakari obsession. Um, okay. Uh, each time this unit is selected as the target of an attack, if this attack is below... Sorry, if this unit is below half strength, when resolving that attack, if a model in that unit would lose a wound, roll 1d6 on a 4+. plus. That wound is not lost. Crikey. Wow. Yeah, not bad that. Uh, each time a model in this unit would lose a wound as a result of a mortal wound, if this unit is below half strength, roll to six on a four plus, uh, that wound is not lost, uh, and this unit is eligible to declare a charge in a turn in which it fell back. So there you go. Shrugging wounds on four plus once your unit has dipped below half strength. Crikey. Strong. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. What would the optimal number be in that circumstance you think in order to best ensure a level of unit operational authority or you know ability as it were while also then still gaining the benefits of falling below high strength would it be seven maybe would seven be the number you'd shoot for can they can they take can they take units in 20 at all or is that not for them they could do, yeah. I think they could. I think the uh, the, the racks can, uh, can 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 rack it up uh, to use a old slash snooker terminology. But um, no, I think I think maybe they cap out at ten. These are again another beautiful example of us not knowing enough to be overly critical of our review of this, uh, and yet another good reason exactly. to advocate to go over to Real Space Raiders. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> but the point is, is that it seems like a good ability once you drop to a certain level of health. You're shrugging off stuff on four pluses. Not bad, is it? No, not too bad. Too. There you go. You sound so unimpressed by that, Phil. It's quite hilarious. Uh, no, it, no, it's, it's it's good. But at the same time, it's like you've got to lose a lot of stuff to to finally benefit from it. And it's like if 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 you're losing that much, you're probably in a in a bad situation. But that's true. You know, 
it, it counts when it counts though so you know it might not be might not be that bad might not be that bad i think you know it seems very strong uh if you've got enough models still around uh so if, if it only kicks in when you've got five models left what are those five models doing like unless they're really tough five models of course in which case it might be doing quite a lot indeed there is there tell us about their warlord traits philip Yep, so the first one is the Calculating Gaze, which is an aura ability. So while a friendly uh, homunculus coven core unit is within six inches of this warlord, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, re-roll a hit roll of one. It's all right, isn't it? So it's I mean, re-roll a hit roll of one is all right, isn't yeah. it? Always good. Yeah. Uh, you've got Shimmer Supreme. Um, which I think that's like a love- schema, schema Supreme. Not Shimmer Supreme. I mean, it could be, because he likes to shimmy yeah. away on the dance shimmy, floor. Shimmy, shimmy. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be, I would assume, his go-to move. Yes. Yeah, little, Why not? You little always got to have a signature move on the dance floor, Phil. What's your signature move these days? Um, the classic, just finger-pointing. You like the point. Yeah. I'm a fan of the trolley, you know, the shopping trolley. So you like uh, pushing it around. Okay, do you have to put the pound coin in first? You do that oh yeah, bit? absolutely. It's all part of the pageantry of the dancing. Goes okay. the pound coin. Then you've got to it, wangle the chain, even though it, you know, it never quite works yeah. the way you want. And then, then at the end of the night, do you just push the trolley into the corner and run off, but so you don't actually put it back? That's true. That's true. There's like a little casual kind of conclusion to it, where I kind of push the trolley away in a kind of really dramatic fashion, almost kind of Michael Jackson esque in my head, although not necessarily in execution. And then I flee from the scene, filled with guilt. Brilliant. Much like this guy with his Shimmer Supreme. Uh, while, while this Warlord is on the battlefield, each time your opponent spends a command point to use a strategy, you can roll D6 on a 5+. plus. You gain one command point. It does definitely sound like he should be a Schema Supreme, um, but we know better. Uh, next one, Phil. Ooh, Artist of Dark Alchemy. Uh, so once per turn, after rolling to determine the number of attacks made with a weapon by friendly homunculus coven core model... Uh, whose unit is within six inches of the warlord, this warlord can use this ability. If it does so, you can re-roll the number of attacks made with that weapon and, until the end of the phase, each time you roll to the number of attacks with a weapon by a model in that unit, you can re-roll the results. So, is it just on one unit? Yeah, once per turn. So a unit can re-roll the number of attacks it's doing and it can re-roll those attacks as well. Fair enough. It sounds all right. You don't agree, Phil? Uh, hold on. It, I think it's... Hold on. If it does so, you can re-roll the number of attacks made with the weapon and until the end of a phase, each time you roll to determine the number of attacks with the weapon, you can... Re- Isn't it just saying you can re-roll the number of attacks twice? Like it seems to be repeating itself. Once per it turn, after rolling to determine the number of attacks made by uh, with weapon by a friendly homunculus coven core model whose unit is within six of this warlord, this warlord can use this ability. If it does so, you can re-roll the number of attacks made with that weapon, and until the end of the phase, each time you roll to determine the number of attacks made with a weapon by a model in that unit, you can. Reroll. Right. Results. So what it means is the first time you roll a result that you don't like, you activate it. You can reroll that one, I guess, mm-hmm. one weapon in a unit. But then for the rest of the phase, any other results, as in because you're attacking models one at a time, I guess. Correct. That's the way. But the I guess you would be work, yeah. technically fast rolling them all potentially. So you see one you don't like, go cool. I'm just rerolling whichever ones and just picking them. Yeah. Yeah, very, yeah. A bit oddly worded, but in the uh, sort of the way you roll the dice and meant to do it, yeah, one at a time, it, it does make sense. Yeah, it makes sense if you understand the fundamental oddity rules. that is the rules. Yeah. Um, but it's fine. I mean, you know, again, there's the way you play it and the way it's written, um, as long as the two can somewhat align, which I feel like it does to an extent. I have to be honest with you, though, it's that weird thing where. It's weird to have an ability that triggers in response that then's not linked to a stratagem. That's quite a rare thing in um, in uh, in 40k at the moment. Have a reactive 
aura yes, ability. Or, uh, yeah, yeah a ability. once per turn war or trait that isn't just re-roll a dice roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, yeah. It, and it's, yeah, triggers on units uh, won't go off on the character specifically. So you have to have some very specific synergies in mind um, in order to sort of reap the benefits of that. Um, and again, based on the fact that it's specifically core keyword that extends to then homunculus covens. <sighs> yeah. I mean, and it's a homunculus coven core, so you wouldn't even necessarily be able to make it work on any of your blades for hire. So you're literally looking at the liquefier guns or whatever it is on, um, on um, rack units. So it seems very situational or very unlikely to be super awesome because you can't use it on things like, you know, Talos or Kronos, for example. Unless Kronos retained the core keyword. I don't know. I know they took it off a of Talos because it was a little bit too crazy, but mm. they may have kept it on the Kronos, and maybe this is where that comes into effect. Because that thing is covered in flamers, so fair enough. Let's talk about the relics. We've got the transfer of excruciation. Uh, it is transfuser. A... Why must you spoil everything I do? I mean, it's a podcast. They don't know because they're not reading along. So I, exactly. I could just so let you didn't, it slide. Need, you didn't let, need to point it out to him, didn't they? What did they yeah. even say? Uh, transfer, I thought you said. Oh, I thought it was the transfer, but no, you're right. When you read it properly, it says transfer versus a transfuser. Yeah. Transfuser? Yeah. <sighs> One of these days I'll learn to read. Um. Anyway, uh, you exchange a I-Core injector only. This relic replaces the I-Core injector and has the following profile. It's a melee attack uh, with no profile, but an ability. Each time the bearer fights, no more than one attack can be made with this weapon. Each time an attack is made with this weapon, if a hit is scored, the target suffers one mortal wound and the attack sequence ends. Each time a unit, excluding vehicle units, suffers a mortal wound from this weapon, until the end of the battle, that unit is poisoned. While well, the unit is poisoned, subtract one from its ballistic skill, weapon skills, and strength characteristic. All right, I guess. They've, they they brought back they the old it. universal special rule. Well, actually, no, because poison uh, just meant you wounded on a two-up, wasn't it? it yeah, was, yeah. Uh, or whatever it used to be, yeah. It's interesting. Kind of a cool concept. Yeah, but I, when I when I've armed a relic onto something, I'd far sooner the thing I target just to be dead, rather than debuffing it. You know. Well, here's the thing: if if you are charging into combat with something, knowing it's going to take like a turn or two turns to kill something, mm. uh, then this is a good thing to put on it because it means your unit's going to be more survivable because they're hitting you at worse weapon skill um, and strength as well. So yeah, um, maybe useful against big uh, monster armies like Nids and things potentially. I suppose yeah, you... like big swarms, especially stuff's going to keep coming back. It's like cool, you got loads of termagants that are going to keep 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 coming back alive. But it's like yeah, but now you're at permanent minus uh, you know strength and weapon skill, ballistic skill. It's like yeah, great. It's uh, going to slow them down, uh, even if you can't like kill them quick enough, uh, so to speak. Okay. What's the next one, mate? Uh, so, Mask of Torment. Um, Courtiers of a homunculi model only at the start of the morale phase. Select one enemy unit within 12 inches of the bearer. Until the start of the next command phase, subtract four from the leadship characteristic of the models in that unit. That is a big leadership debuff. Um, hey, if leadership was in any way punishing... Uh, in the game, I'm sure they would really feel yeah, the pain. If you, if yeah, you really need to combo that with a you know negative to your combat attrition as well to make it worthwhile. So they're failing combat attrition on like ones, twos, or even threes potentially. Um, yeah, otherwise it's a bit pointless. Yeah, totally agree. I think the thing is with that stuff though, I suppose for Drakari there are some units that benefit from uh, rules that trigger in response to leadership. So there are instances where you, you know, roll to beat leadership in order to make them fight last in the case of like, um, in the case of uh, Incubi. So I suppose there is a value to it in that context, but even then in terms of what it means, you know, failing leadership tests isn't 
absurdly punishing. And if it really, really mattered to you, you just pay two CP and don't worry about it, right? Which again is a bit of a crazy mm. way of sort of uh, you know devaluing the whole uh, the whole procedure procedures proceedings words. God, I'm on a I'm in a bad way today. <laughs> anyway, let's try and uh, say the words correctly. This time we have a stinger of. Gorgia pistol? Stinger yeah, Gorgia pistol. pistol yeah. yeah, lovely. Uh, you go to a homunculus thing. Uh, one's equipped with a stinger pistol. Uh, and this is uh, range 12, pistol 5. Quite a few shots from that. Strength 2, 1 damage, AP 0. Um, but it's a poison weapon. It always wins on 2 plus. Um, and then each time the bearer is selected to shoot after resolving its attacks, if any... Models in enemy units, excluding vehicles, lost one or more wound um, from those attacks until the end of the turn. Each time a friendly model makes an attack against that enemy unit, improve the armor penetration characteristic of the attack by one. Hmm, okay. Interesting. So the situation seems to be that the little needle stinger thing will have left a bit of a, a chink in the armor, you know, like what old Sanguinius did. Hmm. Yeah. Or a lowly guardsman, if the original stories be true. That is true. Anyway. Yeah, whatever. Next one. Yeah. Uh, Bio-targeting all... Why do you get the easy ones? Why is this today? Um, uh, absolute disgrace. It's because I'm pondering my orb. Um, <laughs> so, Corti is away, a homunculi uh, model only. At the start of the first battle round, select one enemy unit on the battlefield, excluding vehicle units. Uh, until the end of the battle, the bearer gains the following ability. Bio-targeting orb. It's an aura ability. Uh, while a friendly uh, homunculus coven core or homunculus coven character unit is within six of this model, each time a model in that unit makes an attack against the enemy unit you selected at the start of the first battle round, add one to the attack's hit roll. So plus one to hit against a unit. I mean, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. That's their relics. Let's do the stratagems. So we're going to kick off with... A red stratagem, uh, which is a requisition stratagem, uh, and it's called Rule Free Fear. Use the stratagem before the battle when you are mustering your army. Select one uh, homunculus character model from your army until the end of the battle. Add free to the range of aura abilities. Uh, each time that model uses an ability in your command phase, add free to the range of that. You can always use this stratagem once, unless you're playing a game of 2,000 points, in which case you can use it twice. Or if you're playing something like 3,000 points or more, you can use it three times. Ooh. Yeah, whatever. Adding three to the range of auras actually is consistently really strong, to be fair. I shouldn't really kind of uh, brush it off as anything other than actually being quite good. So, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, it's not bad. Especially when, as we just talked with the relic, you've got an aura ability. It gives you plus one to hit against admittedly just one target. But, you know, if it's a key yeah. one that you want dead, that's quite useful and you can spread out a bit more. Um, I agree. Next one, again, requisition stratagem, Art of Poisonry, 1 CP. Use a stratagem before the battle when you're mustering your army. Select one courtiers of a homunculi core unit from your army until the end of the battle. Uh, for each model in that unit, if the model is equipped with a weapon that has the Poison Weapon 4 Plus ability, treat it as Poison Weapon 3 Plus instead. And again, you can only use it once uh, unless you're doing Strike Force at 2,000 points, in which case it's two uh, times. So yeah, that's very strong. For 1CB as well, that's crazy good. Well, can be strong until you remember, obviously, that you're not going to be able to take any of the uh, units that really bring... Um, Lots of the uh, poison weapons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, racks for the most part aren't really bringing a lot of poison weapons. Um, particularly within Tricari, it's typically the... Uh, Know, the, uh, the the actual Cabalite warriors and things like that mm. uh, rocking a lot of poison. Um, plus, let me just triple check something. All units army must have... Okay, all units must have... All units... Yeah, okay, fine. So that would ex actually extend to your Blades for Hire, so you could... So actually, yeah, you could use that with Scourges. Um, and Scourges can have a lot of poison. So actually, yeah, if you if you're using that on a big unit of scourges uh, with poison weapons, that's pretty reasonable. So, fair enough. Not bad. Uh, wealth and power is the next one. Oh, I like that. 
I do like a bit of wealth and power. Uh, never had the opportunity to experience either. Um, but, you know, that's obviously why I uh, why I, I desire it so. Anyway, uh, one CB, use the stratagem before the battle. When mustering your army, select one homunculus core unit from your army until the end of the battle. Each time a model in that unit uh, makes a range attack, add one to the strength characteristic of that attack. You can only use the stratagem once, unless you're playing 2,000 points, in which case you can use it twice. Or if you're playing 3,000 points, in which case you can do it three times. Although that is the limit. Um, yeah, all right, fair enough. Adding to the strength. Um, I'm sure there's a particular instance where that's quite good. I just mm. don't know what it is. Um, but, uh, but I'm sure it's there. Yeah. Uh, the next one, we're on to the greeny strategic ploy stratagems with a brutal vivisection, which sounds quite brutal. Uh, it's 1 CP. Use a stratagem in the fight phase when a courtier of a homunculi model from your army destroys a model in the enemy unit. Once again, excluding vehicle units. Um, the next time that enemy unit is selected to fight until the end of a phase, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, subtract one from the attack's wound roll. Ooh, minus one to be wounded against. Uh, but you've got to... Effectively, you've got to fight first, right? Um, yeah. Next time that enemy model until the end of a phase. So I presume it is in that fight phase. Yeah. So if you're, tasty, if you're fighting though. second, pointless. But if you're fighting first, it's good. No, pretty strong. Uh, well, I mean, you know, potentially. Um, visions of butchery. Uh, one CP. Use a stratagem at the end of your charge phase. Select one enemy unit with an engagement range of one or more homunculus units from your army. Roll 1d6 on a 2 plus that unit. Uh, sorry, on a 2 plus until the start of your next charge phase, that enemy unit loses the objective secured ability. Core blimey, that's strong. Yeah, no, that could be really good. Switching off obsec, mate. Oh, oh. And all you have Big to do strong. is do a charge and roll a 2 plus. I mean, if you if you roll a 1, you'll be kicking yourself. Um, yes, because there's no way you can re-roll that. Yeah, no, exactly. And also, when you're doing it is probably very key like a pivotal moment in the game so failing yeah, that but you'll never roll a one that never ever happens to anyone doing that ever I, yeah i'm almost surprised like why make it a two up just just give it to them like i, I mean except that yeah uh, i guess is it fun to roll a one occasionally and be like oh i should have should have been able to do it um it, yeah, it feels very odd that it's... I mean, there are abilities where you're like, okay, I'm going to deny someone psychic power on a four-up, for example. Um, but yeah, because it's a two-up, it's like almost dead cert. Uh, yeah, next one's uh, Mercies of the Homunculus, uh, 1 CP. Uh, use a stratagem in a fight phase when an enemy unit is destroyed by uh, an attack made by a model in the courtiers of a homunculus unit from your army. To the end of a battle, each time a model in the courtiers of a homunculus unit would lose a wound... On a four plus, it's not lost. Yeah, not bad. So, and that lasts to the end of the battle as well. So really? you got to do it. Yeah, use a stratagem in the fight phase when an enemy unit is destroyed. So you got to destroy a whole unit uh, with your unit, and then for oh, MTP, okay. you give them a four plus. Feel no pain. I guess bearing in mind they get that anyway when they're below half strength, so it's only going to be useful for a certain period of time. Um, before you get it for free anyway, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it's still quite good. Could be really strong. Yeah, no, no, I like that. Uh, protect the Great One. Uh, use the stratagem in any phase when a homunculus coven homunculus model from your army loses one or more wounds as a result of an attack uh, made by enemy model until the end of the next uh, to the end of your next turn. Each time a friendly homunculus coven core unit uh, declares a charge that targets that enemy model uh, model's unit, you can reroll the charge. Okay, uh, and each time friendly homunculus coven core unit makes an attack against enemy model's unit, you can reroll the hit roll and you can reroll the wound roll. Jeepers! I mean, obviously it's dependent upon your homunculus having taken a wound, uh, mm. and then I guess by extension not being dead. But if those circumstances come into play, the fact that you're then re-rolling charges, re-rolling hits, re-rolling wounds, 
Um, it's got some lethal potential, I would suggest. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you've got to lose the wounds before it can then kick in. Um, because it's, yeah, until the end of your next turn. So, yeah, b b for one CP, it's pretty good. For what bad. it does. Bad. I mean, a clever player knowing that would maybe just go, well, I'll work around this. And I'll either try and kill him in a one -er, or just ignore him and let him do some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But then if he's a bit of a linchpin unit from your army, maybe you do want to kill him. Um, and then the last one. So we've got a war gear stratagem, the Greys, uh, Venoms of Agonizing Atrophy. Yeah, 1 CP. Yep, sure. <laughs> um, use a stratagem in any phase when an enemy model, excluding vehicle models, once again, uh, loses one or more wounds as a result of an attack made with a poison weapon by a courtiers of a monkey model from your army. And to the end of your next turn, subtract one from the attacks characteristic of models in that unit. Uh, so yeah, any phase, an enemy model loses a wound and it's specifically poisoned weapons. Hmm. And then it only lasts for a turn. There's a lot of... This is a very debuffy army, I would say. Yes. Lots of stuff just do debuffs to units that are on activation of you having already done something to that unit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to say... It's it, a I very, very tricky list on top of an army that's already pretty tricky. I think in the hands of, obviously, someone who is a real Drakari specialist, I'm sure they can find a lot of interesting ways to bring this into effect, but it feels just a little bit too... It feels a little too clever for its own good, you know? It just doesn't really seem to me like an army that jumps off the page. Yeah, a... it's it's sort of very thematic in terms of, oh, I'm using lots of poison and it's going to modify you, mutate you and, you know, make you uh, weaker in some way, whether that's losing strength, ballistic skill, leadership, um, uh, armor penetration, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, I just don't like it, though. Like, it's, it's a sort of a win more mechanic. Like, you can only activate stuff by already winning uh like basically damaging or destroying units and then it allows you to damage that unit some more or destroy other units but if you're already in a struggling like uphill battle to begin with you just might not get any of these stuff off uh, with the exception of the one where you just have to like charge in and switch off obsec that one seems very strong but it's like okay, yeah, cool. That is I, I, I need to kill this unit to be able to do something. And it's like okay, cool. I tried. I charged in. And I failed. Okay, means I've got to wait another whole turn before I can maybe pull this off. Um, mm. But I mean, Drakari are strong anyway, so maybe they they do all of these things no problem. Uh, basically, I mean, I don't think so. I don't think they are that strong that they can that they can guarantee getting this stuff. And again, it's just, it's one of those armies, right? And again, it's another beautiful kind of depiction of the, uh, the way that ninth edition plays, right? Because it, it, it's one of those where it's all like, I know we've said this a lot here and apologies for being, you know, a bit of a broken record on that topic, but it's that sort of, you know, trading card game mechanics where, you do this and this triggers this and I spend this to do this. And then, Oh, you've triggered this trap and ah, things occur. And again, obviously it's cool that those mechanics are in there and I'm not saying I dislike them necessarily. It's just sometimes like this, they can just become a bit too much is probably the easiest way of phrasing it. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I just think, I, I just think it's one of those weird ones where, I mean, fair play if you've got the mind for it, but I just, yeah, it's not something I would be falling over myself to play. I I also wonder, and this is something Paulie could answer because he knows Jakari really well, um, if that uh, Armies of Renown isn't very playable because of the neuters that Jakari has had to the balanced data slate. So obviously they took it, they removed core from some units, and mm -hmm. I wonder, and obviously that army list synergizes so much with poison weapons and as you say some things might have poison that were core but now no longer are because the balanced data slate came out you know a few months ago obviously that book would have probably been in print before, prior to the balanced data slate so they might not have been aware of the changes coming up 
uh, you know, because the you know balance state state so digital would have happened, you know, effectively a week before they actually published them. So it'd be interesting to see how playable this list would have been prior to the balance state state, and if it's had any negative changes from balance state state impacting this list because it was written before it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, mate. I would assert that that is almost certainly the case. That obviously it will have suffered as a result of that, but to what extent it's difficult. To yes, it, it pro- probably wouldn't be a huge amount, like to the point where it's unplayable, because we would have heard about that, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, it might just have negatively impacted it slightly by you know losing some optimization on some of those units. Agreed. All right, there we go. Uh, that was us talking about the Drakari part of this book. Uh, we're going to move on now to whatever it is that comes next. Transitional noise. And there we go, mate. The end of the show. How did you find that one? Oh, um, enlightening, actually. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, it was um, felt like one of the easier um, war zone books to get through. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the thing is, I quite like about uh, going through nicely contained small rules is that it just doesn't quite feel as laborious as obviously when you try and kind of dissect codexes. Um, and obviously, we're victims of our own stupidity to an extent when it comes to that whole situation, because obviously no one is forcing us uh, to review codexes in the way that we choose to do so. Um, But yeah, it's definitely been one of those things that we are continuing to evaluate on the basis that uh, it's, it's a tough old grind getting through those, uh, those codex reviews. And I do really appreciate and enjoy when we have an opportunity to just sort of talk about rules, but to do so in a way uh, that isn't quite as uh, intense. Although I think, again, Phil, and you know, this is a general topic, isn't it? But I think that's the thing that we need to really kind of take stock of moving forwards is how we're going to continue to approach these things because ultimately the way we've been doing the last little while kind of worked when it was weekly. But I think with the fortnightly format, it just turns into this long sort of drawn out saga of an episode that probably isn't all that entertaining for the listeners. And we kind of feel like we want to get back to just a bit of the old general chit chat, don't we? Yeah, talking about other stuff. I mean, basically, we've had to, because we've not necessarily been able to record uh, every week sometimes, because we do like to squeeze in an extra episode when we can. But Absolutely. more recently, we've literally had to do a codex. And as part of that, sandwich in an extra segment which is one of the last two episodes, I think, have been like five hours long because we've Correct. done the Warhammer Fest reveals on the back of a Codex episode as well, rather than being able to split them out into their own uh, individual episodes, which would obviously make more sense to do. But just due to the logistics of recording, we've not um, been able to do that on those occasions. Um, I mean, speaking of which, there was the uh, Warhammer Skulls uh, reveals uh, yesterday. Did you have a chance to look at those? I saw nothing of them and have no idea what happened. Well, they basically showed off uh, a bunch of games for, uh, you know, the Warhammer franchise. Fair play. I mean, that is the thing, though, isn't it, with Games Workshop at the moment? They are churning out the content. I think, you know, at the moment, they just, you know, it seems like they got stuff going on all the time at the moment, which is great for us to an extent because obviously it gives us... Uh, stuff to talk about but also to uh another extent uh it, it does make it challenging because it's quite hard to keep on top of everything that's going on um and i think you know at the moment the thing i'm probably most excited about i suppose like a great many people hopefully is uh heresy i think heresy is looking super fun um i've really been enjoying running the imperial knights though phil let's not pretend i haven't been because i really have i think they've actually Surprisingly, so I really thought that Codex uh, Elder or Eldari was going to be my big return to form for 40k. Mm. But I have to be honest, I actually think upon balance or on balance, I think I'm going to or am now enjoying Imperial Knights way more than I ever imagined I would. Is, is coming fifth in a top tournament with said Imperial Knights um, swaying your opinion uh, at all? 
uh, fourth, uh, by the way. Oh, but, oh uh, fourth. Oh, was it fourth? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dan. Sorry. Number right. four. Uh, not quite, you know, not quite podium, but you know, close enough. No, 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 no. Unfortunately, uh, our good friend Adam Shepherd Jones uh, defeated me by, I think it was two points in the end. Um, I say that as if I don't know exactly. It was two points. Um, but, um, <laughs> no, uh, no. I mean, let's let, let's be honest. Someone else also actually defeated you. Our good buddy Richard, who he played against. At... Well, it depends how you look at it, though, right? Because I mean, yeah, he did beat me in the game that we played together. He was my one loss of the. Uh, of the weekend but then when all was said and done i came fourth and he was 10th so i mean I who really beat who because yeah well because yeah so uh, for, for context this was the um warhammer world i don't think it was called a gt it was like a warhammer world tournament match or play, ma- match event. play event yeah so effectively a tournament uh, in all but name um because they seem to just say... I think very the, much in name, Phil. I think they did include the word tournament in there somewhere. We, it felt tournament. Oh, okay, sorry, no. Uh, yeah, they, they sometimes label... what They have, like, the grand tournaments, like the GT. It wasn't called that, even though it's... Because it's a match play event tournament, it's sort of that thing, really, as well. Um, yeah, so you, you Richie, uh, and another guy, uh, Richie knows called Spike, went, who we've mentioned a couple of times on the podcast. And did well, Adam so. and Simon. Who's Simon? Uh, Simon Shepard Jones, brother to Adam oh Shepard-Jones. yes, yeah, yeah. So I mean, but you weren't really, they weren't really coming up with us or with you guys. They were just that's it, I I, I was of the opinion I was going up with them more, much more than I was going up with Richie. Oh, oh well, poor Richie. No, that's not true. I'm only saying it to be difficult. No, I did, but I did lose to uh, to Rich to go back to it. Uh, it was yeah. a really good game though, really good fun. Um, yes, again, a, a think, knight versus a leviathan. How did that go? Uh, not as the statistics would have you believe. Um, yeah, I, uh, I I fluffed it, basically. I had uh, six attacks on the charge. I hit three of them and then proceeded to wound twice. Uh, and then he saved one of them. Uh, and then he just took, you know, seven damage off of it. And then it was like, cool. And then he rolled a bunch of, you know, five up fill no pains. Or six up. I oh, know it was five up. Feel no pains, and he passed like a bunch of them. Okay, nice. fair enough. I whiff that. Um, but yeah, look, I'm not going to get blow by blow into that whole thing. Um, but no, I, you know, to be completely real, I don't necessarily feel like my love of the knights book has been um, negatively impacted by having done well with them at a Warhammer World event. But I think, irrespective of that result, I just enjoyed the way it played. There's a few things I really like about the knight. My knight army that i'm running at the moment one it has absolutely no re-rolls baked into it anywhere i re-roll nothing like nothing in the army re-rolls a single dice unless i pay cp wow yeah that's pretty mad uh secondly uh it's got a low model count all my games are done super quick uh i had one game uh against a lovely lad called toby um who was running wraith knights and that game took us about 20 minutes all in (laughs) um that was fantastic that was the last game of the weekend it was done in 20 minutes we we did joke that we could have done the best two out of three um but i was like (laughs) after five games i was just like hey all right i'm gonna i'm gonna take my win and run away (laughs) because sensible yeah um but yeah so it was one of those things right like i just think you win big or you lose big um but the the third and final part of the Knight Codex that I love, especially with the way that I play them right now that I've gotten to my, well, I've gotten to the point that I understand it mechanically in the sense that I get how the Oath system works and I get how that whole sequence functions. It, it doesn't really take a lot of thinking. And it's an army where you can just push tempo and you can just create problems for your opponent. And you've got a few little tricks that you can throw at them, but really it's a really blunt instrument. You just go, there's a gallant, Work out what you're going to do with that, and then I'm just going to rain bullets at you from 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 the backfield while you try and deal with that. And then usually with the way the gallant performs, it'll take at least one or two turns to see it dead. And then at that point, you know they're they're, they're in the stranglehold at that point, and it's tough to get out of. But again, obviously, great players, even good players, even bad players, uh, can fight their way out of it. It's just it's a fun list. It's easy to play. And what I love about it in the context of tournament play is that I just, yeah, I don't have to go into anything with a kind of set sense of 
any kind of grand strategy. It's it's it's, it's a simple dumb army uh, that does fun stuff, and and that's the thing. It's just it's you know because at the moment 40k is just complicated enough. So I just like the fact that my army bar figuring out the oath stuff is super simple, and I'm down with that. It's easy. Run in, smash stuff up, win or lose, uh, depending on my ability to roll four pluses. Go home. <laughs> that's the mm. thing so yeah so bizarrely i'm really enjoying imperial knights at the moment but um but yeah it's um it's been fun though i mean that that event was cool feels like a lifetime ago but i think it was only last weekend wasn't it um, oh no it was the weekend, the weekend before yeah. Yeah, yeah it was when the last episode went out so yeah that was good i was pretty happy with it i don't really know if i want to do like a whole long kind of like overview of things but i did okay four wins one loss lost to richie um who unfortunately got a really bad loss in the last game. I think Rich uh, was a bit, not robbed, because I think he was always going to lose, but um, it seems like the guy who was playing against was being a little bit, uh, and uh, you know, just a little bit loose with the rules, it seemed. Again. Yes, uh, that's, I think that is how the, the, the polite way. <laughs> it's difficult though, isn't it, right? Because you hear, hear these things, but it's a bit of a kind of their word against theirs kind of, you know, situation i I didn't bear witness to it i just obviously heard richie's account of it afterwards oh, yeah, it sounded a little bit suspect but yeah i don't but, it can always come off a bit sour grapes but you know yeah. richie's my boy so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so richie won the fir- his first four games so he was on like the top table for the uh final game which was an, an achievement uh an accolade he's he's never done before so it's tough going man very well going to four and to is, is hard to with do. with space marines you know not not blood angels there was no centurions in his list he had um uh, lots of dreadnoughts as always uh running the mazar in hands as he always does um and his leviathan i think was the star of all his matches pretty much uh thanks to arm of contempt and it being a leviathan um, and it having five up feel no pain yes yeah so you know well, well played for richie to to get that far yeah, I mean, he did really well to go 4-0. and um, His final opponent was running Harlequins, uh, which is a really tough matchup for the, uh, Rich's army regardless. Uh, you know, heart goes out to old Rich. He's uh, He played it well. I feel like going through what he got went through to get to where he was, it felt like he deserved the win uh, just because obviously mm. he played myself in game two. Not that that's any great accolade, but he did do it and he did beat me. Uh, only guy to beat me that weekend. He played uh, Adam Game Free, who came third overall. Uh, so Adam Shepard Jones with his custodies. Uh, only loss of the weekend uh, was to uh, Richie. And then he played a guy called Brad, who was running um, Tau, a beautifully painted Tau army um, with all crazy uh, Iden F deep kin. Oh, models. conversion. Yeah, that's yeah, Brad incredible. Glover on Instagram. Yes, that's him. Uh, somewhat involved with another podcast called Tea and Something. Tea and Tactics, maybe. I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, I'll look it up. Um, there we go. It yeah. Is, yeah, it's quite funny that Richard basically played the people that I presume came first, third, and fourth, and two of those, two of the three he'd actually beaten. Uh, he played, so for so, him yeah. to get 10th spot seems a bit unfair. But I guess that is how tournament scoring format works. Yeah, so um, he played. It's not he, a knockout round, is it? It's a, a points based system. Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, he played the overall winner, the guy that came third, the guy that came fourth, and the guy that came seventh. And he came tenth. Oh. <laughs> so, so everyone he beat actually came higher than him. Except his very first game. His very first game was against this beautifully painted White Scars army. Um, but I think it was a young lad who'd gone to his first ever tournament um, and it was gorgeously painted, but maybe wasn't quite as optimised oh, for... Did you know, uh, Richard uh, teach him a lesson to never come to a tournament ever again? Did he make him uh, cry and run away? I, I mean, probably. That's what I heard, you know. I think he, uh, you know, he, he rubbed his face in the dirt. He was, uh, he was, he, he, he's, you know, he's not a gracious winner. Oh, old Rich, I know firsthand. Uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he, he, he's, he likes to make a point of it. But uh, no, he's, <laughs> he has mentioned it a lot, hasn't he? So far, God bless him. But to be fair, I mean, it was. Look, this is the thing. It, it was one of those where I felt for him. Um, 
but again, it, as I said to him, the problem is when it comes to the final games, whenever you've gone 4-0 at a tournament, you've got to assume that the guy that you're coming up against has got some interesting tactics or some interesting stuff that got them there as well. And you need to be quite... And I know this sounds really horrible and really, you know, not necessarily in the spirit of the game necessarily, but that's the thing at the higher levels you do. When you're on the top table in the final game, obviously, you know, give back what you get. You know, you don't want to be horrible just for the sake of it. But at the same time, you do need to really make sure that what is happening is accurate. I mean, again, a lot of the time when I've played in those situations, the people I'm playing against are fantastic human beings and we've had great games. But equally, there you know have been instances where I've come away thinking, oh, that seemed a little bit suspect or something like that. I mean, that's very rare, but it can happen. And I think that's the thing. You just got to... That you know, you can grumble about it as much as you want after the fact, but the problem is, is once it's done, it's done, and there's no there's no opportunity for you to take it back. Once yes, it's done. yeah, I think I think the key takeaway from it is very much uh, in to be in the best position to win. You actually need to know how your opponent's army works and operates. Like you need to know all the rules, all the stratagems. Partly so if they do something that's incorrect, you can call them on it and just say, "Oh, I think this is wrong." Otherwise, you will basically blissfully go along with it, not realising it's incorrect. And not to say it's intentional, because I think 90% of the time it will be an honest mistake. It's like I Well, that's the, the thing, B- isn't it? Because I watched the BAO final, and that was not a mess, but it was that they, the, the chat and the commentators kept pointing out mistakes that both players were making. And these are the final of a very big respected event but it's also i think it was like their ninth game in three days so i think the idea is the fatigue had set in and was clearly visible on both players so they were making kind of tiny mistakes here and there um uh, just completely unintentional and if the other person was aware of the opponent's army to a level where they could call out that mistake then it would sort of rectify and sometimes they did they did catch a couple of errors uh and misplays that they had done and then they'd, they'd kind of gone back and, and changed the results of, of of those outcomes of like combat and stuff um so yeah that's the only way you can really defend yourself um against that but that's a really hard thing to do because there's so many different armies out there oh yeah uh, and sub factions within a particular army so you, you're never really going to learn master of a game where you know everyone's rules so that's always impossible and a lot of it's you've just got to go on kind of good faith really that they're doing it correctly and being honest about it yeah i think the i think the thing that's really difficult about it is always that especially with like harlequins as well is like the rules they do have are so crazy that um that's easy uh for you know little mistakes to, to crop through and again i i, I really hesitate to dogpile this guy because the fact is is that i didn't witness the game i've only heard an account of it but it did sound like there were a few little instances of things that probably shouldn't have been but at the same time it's like you know it is what it is i think the best thing you can always do in those situations is just challenge that stuff and you know again i think you know i would always encourage everyone playing 40k in any kind of you know competitive setting to approach the game the way that you expect it to be played in return. I honestly very rarely read what my opponents have. And I am very, very well these days anyway, long ago I used to care a lot more, but these days I just don't. I'm like, if you really want it that badly, you can have it. Like, you know, to me now I just, you know, winning at all costs or not even winning at all costs, just coming first in tournaments it isn't the be or an end or for me now. I'm, I'm my aspiration is to go and have a fun weekend. Now that being said, if I found myself in a circumstance where I could then, by extension, somehow win the event, you, you couldn't guarantee that by that game I probably would take it seriously. So if I was in Richie's situation, I probably would pay a little bit of attention to what my opponent has and you know what they can do. I mean, truth be told, complete transparency. My final game against Toby, I read his list. It was the only list of the weekend I read before I turned up. I checked what all of his abilities were and everything was because it was the final game. And if I did really well in it, I was going to, you know, potentially come third or maybe even second. 
So I cared enough to care at that game. But all four games mm. leading up to that, I did not care at all. <laughs> um, and then, and then, as it turned out, because I've played Toby before and he's an absolute top geezer, um, it was just one of those things that even though I had done the research before I turned up at the tabletop, as soon as I saw it was him and I realised, oh, that's who this is, I was just like, oh, I don't care anymore. What will be, will be. Uh, and he went first and I was like, cool, I've lost. And then he whiffed it so hard. Uh, and I just sort of hit him as a, like a truck in response. It was like, ah, that's how night on night action goes, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the thing, man. It's like, yeah, I think, I think genuinely the way I approach it is, is like, I genuinely, for the most part, games one, two, three, and four, I, you know, you do whatever you want. It's fine. You, if, you, if you're comfortable doing that, good on you, but probably by about game five, if I'm in a, in a good spot of all start caring. But I think, um, you know, if you're someone who is trying to obviously do well at these things, you, you probably should try and, you know, I, I, I'm i surprised that Rich, was, knowing how Rich is, I'm surprised he wasn't more on it. I'm surprised he didn't pick up the things that he's telling me he spotted after the fact. I just assumed that he he's the sort of guy who's so on it usually that yeah I, 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 I yeah but I I think his attitude was most elder stuff have bonkers rules so when yeah, you're told yeah, yeah, something can do something you're like oh of course it does and you just go like, I think at the RFW event the only time I like asked to see a rule was when it had an ability that was similar to abilities other armies have but it it didn't follow the same sort of mechanical steps. So it, it sort of broke that kind of um, sort of system. So it did something else on top of it. And you're like, oh, most of those rules is it almost like if this is a made up example, if something could deep strike it in within six inches instead of nine, right? It, it can do a deep strike, but it somehow doesn't follow the normal conventions that other rules do obviously that one was completely made up uh, but it did something similar and i was like oh can i just check that rule because it seems like it shouldn't do that and i think in the end it did um but sometimes you're they're checking and they'll be like oh actually i was wrong and you're like okay cool well good thing we double checked it sort of thing and half yeah, the time yeah. you go well let's just roll this dice and if i roll above a certain number it doesn't matter anyway because i've definitely passed it or what have you uh, so you don't need to check some things um uh, yeah. And I, yeah. I think that's fair. I think, again, it's about how you approach it. Right. And um, yeah, I widely acknowledge that I will make mistakes all the time. And I'm sure some people will have come away from games with me and discovered things that I've done wrong and might have suspected that there was foul play involved. Maybe there was. Maybe I am a dirty cheat, uh, like everyone says I am. But the thing is, is like nine times out of 10, it's usually because I just made a mistake. Um, and I think nine times out of 10, or even 99 times out of 100, that is what happens to everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, for all, all intent, for all all in all likelihood, that's what could have occurred to Rich. Because, again, game five, it's a long weekend. And, again, as you were trying to say as well, you saw it with, um, uh, what was it? The oh, BAO. The BAO. Yeah. yeah, the BAO. Like, by the time you've done nine games or whatever, it's a 40K, your brain is frazzled, especially when you're running armies like what those two lads were running. I think old... Um, uh, Costello was running the the the, the Nids and um, the other American. Uh, Jesse was running, was running um, uh, Sisters of Battle. Actually, yeah, my God, like yeah. keeping your keeping your head in the game with those armies, is so hard because they are you know like it, it, they've got so many layers and so much match up stuff and I, I mean that's the thing. The problem is is people who are insanely critical of those kind of gamers and of those kind of interactions are typically people who probably don't go to a lot of events themselves and don't really appreciate just how utterly draining it is, but also just how relatively unorganized everything is when you're there in the moment. Right. It's like one of the things I experienced when I was, uh, you know, involved in uh, helping out and TOing at Beachhead back in February was the amount of online chatter about things that we as TOs had done or not done. And they were completely farcical. It was like, that, that's not even reflecting what we did, but they're going, oh, I can't believe they made this ruling about this tower ability or they have allowed this to happen. And if you actually check like our rule FAQ, we'd been really specific and we and we felt like we caught the most of it, but you know, a lot of people online were throwing a lot of shade our way for stuff that we had supposedly done, but actually hadn't done at all. You know, and it was just like, hmm. yeah, it's just interesting how the, uh, how the internet takes stuff and, uh, 
transforms it into something that it isn't. But anyway, the point is, is that, uh, yeah, the event was good. I had a good time at it. I went four and one. Richie went four and one. Adam went four and one. Uh, Simon went four and one. Spike, I think, went three and two. Um, yes, with his ultra means, yeah. Yeah, so all things being equal, it was a, it was a good weekend. Um, it was a shame that Richie didn't come away with a W. Um, I got to drive home with him, or rather drive him home. Uh, so I had to console him uh, on the way back. Uh, he was, uh, yeah, he was loving it. But um, yeah, all things being equal, it was a good time, uh, which is uh, all you can ever consistently hope for on that side of things. You went to RFW, Phil. We didn't really get a chance to talk about that before. How was that by comparison? I did, uh, well, I, I can't necessarily compare it because I didn't get to go to your one, but I did enjoy it. Uh, RFW number two, uh, you were away in France, so you weren't able to come, sadly. It was. Um, but it was really good fun. Um, my first game, uh, the highlight uh, match of the three that I did, uh, also the only one that I won that was a coincidence I'm sure there you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I played uh, Frank who's a, a listener of the show in fact um, stellar chap uh, I think you played him in RFW1 with I did his, yeah um, I did play Frank in RFW1 corn demons uh, he had yeah. a slight he only had uh, three bloodthirsters when I played him I hear he had a couple more when, by the time uh, we well he him. had uh, four no he had three exalted bloodthirsters and Angroff the the beast uh, from Forge World which was a big boy uh, and then he had some uh, what were they like the kind of chariots cannon things skull uh, cannons skull cannons and I think he had two of them and a uh, a couple of units of blood letters, and I think that nice. was it. Um, it was a very scary list. He got first turn. I was like, oh dear God. Uh, he was in my face, uh, turn one, basically. Uh, but turn two, I sort of managed to turn it around, uh, basically. And um, my smash captain actually did smash for a change, and he managed to kill Angroff uh, because I could fall back, uh, shoot him with my uh, double twin Lascana Contemptor. Uh, to knock a bunch of wounds off and then charge back in because I'm a white scar so I could fall back and charge uh, and finish him off with my, my smash captain. Um, so that was a, a pleasing victory for taking um, him down. Uh, yeah, the other three exalted uh, blood versus all had this ability where you it capped the maximum amount of damage you could do uh, per turn, sorry, per you phase. You just get lucky with the rolls or something. Cause yeah, so not... you ran, you randomly roll them, but he um, he paid points to. I think that's what makes them exalted. So you can roll two abilities, um, mm -hmm. and to, so at least one of those abilities for all three of them was the maximum uh, damage per phase, which I think incredible was seven or eight damage you can do. I think it's um, eight because I think that's the calling eight, number, yeah, isn't it? So that made it even harder. Uh, but uh, my boy, one of my uh, contemptors with a chain fist and a, a melter gun managed to kill i want to say it was two exalted uh demons uh plus a oh a soul grinder he had a soul grinder as well um, nice and also he had basically slung sh slingshotted himself across the board in literally two turns and scored mm -hmm, line breaker mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well by the end killing the soul grinder that was in frank's deployment zone I mean, it was obviously it was just a really fun and hilarious uh matchup but also like super thematic as well uh, and it was this is the thing that made me realize like going up against big things like knights and giant crazy demons yeah. on one hand is really scary but it's also really fun uh especially when you, you kill one of them like it feels like an achievement like i could have lost that game but because i killed angron angraf in combat i was like yes i've done something i've defeated i've had a i've had a victory that's more important to me than actually winning the game um so those kind of moments are really cool. And I, I sort of think like that's probably what happens when you go up against knights as well. You get that sort of similar kind of uh, satisfaction. Um, second game, I actually played Spike, of all people, uh, with his Ultramarines. Um, I made a few sort of silly mistakes and I wasn't really taking it all too seriously. Because basically my mission every game was for my Warlord to slay the other Warlord in combat. Um which actually I, I don't think I even technically did in the first game because uh, my captain smashed into uh, Angroff um, and someone else killed the Warlord, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, get game two, I charged him into Kalgar, uh, didn't kill him. I didn't die uh, that turn, but I did die soon afterwards. 
and yeah i made it made a few silly plays and actually i made some really dumb mistakes as well like i deep struck two um squads of inceptors uh, into his deployment zone to try and shift mm. him off of his home objective because you scored three points for holding uh their objective two for the one in the middle and then one for the one in your deployment zone now i could have deep struck them down into my deployment zone to shoot his plasma inceptors that had also deep struck into my deployment zone that would have been the sensible play but i was like nah well i'm not taking it too seriously i'm gonna go into his deployment zone uh but so he then all spec scanned them managed to kill a couple of them and then in the next turn i'd realized i'd actually forgotten to shoot them and that was a critical turn because they were also it was in the tactical doctrine so it'd be minus two ap shooting things in cover and again with um armor of contempt it was a bit of a slog i discovered marines on marines is really boring to an extent but also quite hard you're doing lots of mini micro maths constantly because of uh, armor of contempt it's like oh cool what's your save free up okay it's now two up because you're in cover um i've got minus one ap gun but it's actually minus two ap because i'm in tactical doctrine oh but you ignore one of those so it's actually minus one so your two up save becomes three up save it's like okay and because every weapon's different and depending on whether you're in cover or not the saves is different it's like there's no consistency it's not always oh i'm shooting at you it's always a three up save or four up save like it sort of feels like it normally would be you're constantly trying to work out what the, the dice roll needs to be and all of that stuff every single turn for every single unit it's just really really annoying <laughs> it's just, it takes up a lot of time like that game and my third game uh didn't finish it did, we didn't complete all of our turns and i think it was partly just because it was marines versus marines and we're doing all this like micro maths every time we're rolling the dice um so yeah i lost uh against spike i was up in the first two turns and then we would have we were drawing in the third turn and then um, no maybe i think i was winning for the first three turns drawing for the uh fourth turn and then lost in the fifth i think that's how it worked out um because he had much more uh, models on the board uh than me but i was up in points uh for the first few turns and then the okay. last game i think was against i want to say his name is michael or mike something like that he had dark angels um yeah, it was a, a similar game, uh, quite fun. Um, I tried to... Um, oh, who did he have? He had the uh, captain on the jet bike. Samuel. Samuel, he had that. So I was like, I'm going to charge him in with my captain. My smash captain's going to charge in. Did a bunch of damage, but he survived. Uh, in return, he attacked me, but I made all my saves, so I, I, I survived. And I was like, come on, let's have some glorious combat. And he said he just retreated across the board and then shot me to death. Um, uh, with some plasma. That is I, that is how Dark Angels do it, mate. And I was like, no time. I was like, I was like, oh, okay. Um, that bit was a bit unfun um, in terms of it wasn't very cinematic, let's say, because which was what I was kind of just playing for at that point. Um, but, but, <laughs> but but the correct play, I guess, if you want to be technical about it. Uh, yeah, they're all good games though. But my yeah, the first one against Frank was just hilarious. It was great. Yeah. And overall, the game was uh, really, was, the event was really good, really well organised, beautiful day, beautiful location, um, met many of the other Lookouts uh, listeners, uh, one of them was wearing the Space Vampires uh, t-shirt of ours, which I was uh, pretty pleased to see. It's a beautiful thing, mate. No, nice to know. Uh, I will endeavour to be at the next one in... Uh... 2023. No, no, he's doing one in September. No, he's not. He was, uh, but couldn't get the venue. He, so I think he's delayed it back to twenty. He he, did, he was going to do it uh, uh, at one point, and then said he couldn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. I obviously have uh, lost track of the, uh, the it, chat. It, it, it went to oh, I can't do it till next year. Then it was oh I am doing it this year, and then it was oh I'm doing it this year, but it's going to be a bad me and cafe. And then I think he's gone back to his original plan of no, it needs to be at the same venue, so it's not going to be till next year. Okay, well I do think that's the right way to do it. Um, I think the problem is, and no disrespect to Bad Moon Cafe, I really like Bad Moon Cafe, but. The thing is with Bad Moon Cafe is it's a venue that's used for loads and loads of events and it just, you know, it, it, unless you're going to really... What it was, it was he was going to book it out. Well, and that's the that's the way you make it 
good. So if he was going to do that, then I suppose that's something. But it just depends on what the... I, I think it's... Of... Uh, the people that are currently going to RFW are not Londoners, right? So, But trying to get to Bad Moon Cafe, which is in central London or south London, is actually quite difficult. And there's no like nearby parking to make it easy. So know, yeah, because we're going there on Saturday, aren't we? We are. So if you are listening to this podcast on the day it's come out, and you happen to be in London, you can come down to Bad Moon Cafe between, I guess, two and eight at least, two and nine, however late it's until, and we will be you, me, Richie, and Tim will be there playing some games. Well, well please don't hurt us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um yeah so that's that so um no nah, cool man well it's good that we've been doing some events again which is really nice not that we mm. really stopped lately it seems like a far away distant thing all of the uh the time before where we weren't doing anything anymore i know and there's we it got events coming out of our ears because we've got a doubles event coming up next month uh we'll yeah around. this month now mate it's the second of June right now. Oh dear God! Oh, well, good thing I'm not actually painting up anything for it. I'm just rocking what I've already got. And yeah, yes, you're not... everyone, listeners at home, I did paint up my contemptors in time for RFW. They're finally done, which I'm pretty pleased about. You know, well done, mate. No, so I'm uh, painting Black Templars. Um, I figured they'll be fun, so that's what I'm going to be running. Um, so yeah, I've got Black Templars in front of me right now. Uh, Smashing through those. Nice. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. My entire army can be fielded in two transports. And that's it. So it's nice. uh, 18 models, uh, 16 of which go inside of two. Like a Russian doll. Like a Russian doll, yeah. That's it. That's it. Um, yeah, so I've got a repulsor uh, with a crusader squad in it. And then I've got an impulsor with an Empress champion, uh, High Marshal Halbrecht. And uh, a unit for sword Bremen. Nice. That's been good. I'll be taking uh, my Smash Captain, uh, two uh, five band intercessor squads, uh, two squads of Inceptor Bolters uh, with Assault Bolters, and uh, two Contemptors, Relic Contemptors. Um, nice. Probably with Multi Melter and Chain Fists because I love the Chain Fists uh, to, to smash things up. Uh, I so I think that's what I'll, what I'll do. I've got to just toy around with the points to work out how I'm gearing up my captain, I think. And then after this is done, Phil, we're going to shift focus entirely to Horus Heresy. I mean, I'm actually having fun building some Nighthawks at the moment. Not 40k at all. I've jumped on the, the ghosty bandwagon. No, um, fair enough. And I, as much as I am interested in Horus Heresy... I just don't have the inclination to dump a bunch of money on collecting more space marines. So I will, I'll probably um, vicariously watch from the sidelines until I can run my Krieg as uh, like the militia. Um, well, I mean, here's the, here's the thing, mate. Between us friends, by all means, run your Minotaurs as, uh, as heresy something. That is, got- that is literal heresy for most people. Yeah, I know, but, you know, when playing between us mates, who cares? They look like Space Marines. They're on the same side bases. you got, you got, uh, you know, Contempt of Dreadnoughts and so on and so forth. Who cares? Well, that is true. You know, yeah. it's fine. But it might be one of a few times uh, where it'd be fun to actually run my Gorgon. So I might... Um, oh, yeah, there you might, go. I might dust off my Krieg and use all of those that those lovely Forge World models. Um, it do. Bring back for, the Gorgon. Uh, yeah, Gorgon Transport. That'd be fun would be fun all right well anyway there we go that's the end of that uh we've thrown enough shade at some random dude that rich played and then talked about a bunch of other stuff so that was good um look forward to the comment section on that one um <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's hope that doesn't uh trigger anybody um do you remember that one time where we were talking about a guy that did something at an event it wasn't even a guy that i actually played it was someone i played and played and he yes up in our comment section good lord mm. Well, you've got to watch what you say online. Well, that is true, to be fair. And, you know, to be totally real, I didn't really want to be unfair to that individual. I didn't feel like I was. Um, I was just, you know, reiterating what I'd heard. But, um, you know, and that's very much the case here. Uh, hopefully, I've not been too mean on that side of things. But at the same time, you know, like I say, got to support Rich. He, feel, he felt a bit hard done by by the end of it all. Maybe he's just a sore loser, though, eh? Yeah, that could always be the case. I think I feel I feel like we know it is. 
No, not at all. Not at all. Maybe. But not at all. Uh, we're going to move on. Uh, we're not going to move on. We're going to go away, aren't we? That's it now. We're done. Exactly. We are, um, after we spent all that time lambasting Codex reviews, we will be back with another Codex review next episode. We're going to do it differently, though, aren't we, Phil? Oh, are we? This is the we're first time to. about it. Are we? Oh, maybe we're not. We might just do it the way we've done all the other ones. I'm... I feel like we probably need to wait till 10th edition rolls yes. around before we stick change with, the format. Stick with our format, yeah. The, well, exactly. The, the long chat. Our, t- our tedious, yeah. tedious format. <laughs> And then maybe the episode after that, we'll have a break uh, from Codex. Maybe there won't be a Codex for a while. Although I suspect I Chaos so. uh, Codex is due pretty soon as well. I'm excited about that one. We might actually get Joe on for that one, mightn't we? Oh, we could do, actually, yeah. Well, you know, he is quite the Chaos fanboy. That is that is true. Is it, I played is he, his Chaos. Is it, has he got any Chaos still? Oh, he does. He is doing Chaos. Yeah, doing, yeah, he's uh, got Black Legion. Legion. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, he's got third, loads of it. The third time or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, no. Iron Warriors were the ones that he kept doing over and over again. Um, apparently, he's looking at doing Alpha Legion and Heresy. That's uh, the thing that he's talking about. But yeah, no, he he, he does have the Black Legion. Um, which, as I understand, will get well good uh, in this new book, as is the way of things. What's that? Black Legion aren't very good currently. Oh, what a shocker. Now they're incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it's a sort of a general trend for most things. I think you can... Yeah. What? There's been very few things in Ninth Edition where it's come out and gone, well, this is just bad, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, except Necrons, maybe. Wow. Well, no, and they, they were, were the first good. Codex. Yeah, they were good out of the gate. Um, there we go. Anyway, goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. bye-bye.